Yes. Okay, great. So uh, that leads me to, okay, so I'm gonna give a talk then on, on when I get to share a screen um, on data processing. And, and as Shelly and I mentioned, this is, um, uh, I'll share that. Uh, this is a relatively, what, um, simple explanation or, or low level explanation. But so I'll try to go through this quickly. And, and if we, it seems like the, there's more expertise here uh, in this crowd than is uh, warranted for this talk. So some of this might be pretty simple, I'll, but I have sort of many slides. So, and again, this is all on that tiny URL. You can download these slides and you can review them later and ask questions about, about them either today or later by the IFF at mailing list, which we'll talk about at the end too, and how to get more help, where to go for more information. Okay, so access processing, basically getting to chi of k. Um, we measure, we go to the synchrotron, we go to all these great beam lines, or we went to all these beam lines and you're stuck with data. Basically, you're trying to do a measurement of mu, the absorption coefficient, or the uh, mass attenuation coefficient, mu of e, and then try to get that to the oscillations chi of k. Although the, the mu part itself can just be analyzed as Zanes once it's normalized. So this seems pretty basic, but oftentimes the uncertainties in the analysis stem from the uncertainties in the measurement you make itself. So first we need to convert the measured intensities from the fluorescence chambers or from the ion chambers or from the pin diodes or whatever, or from the area detectors that we use for uh, advanced spectroscopies, convert those to mu, and then subtract a smooth pre-edge function through them that removes instrumental backgrounds. And then we want to get a normalized mu so that we can get the absorption from one atom or one idealized or the average atom of that species. And that would, that would be what we use for analyzing Zanes, so the normalized mu. And then to extract the excess, we have to do this background subtraction step, which is a bit tricky and, and uh, or often, often viewed as tricky and, and challenging. Um, it doesn't need to be that hard, but we'll, we'll get to that. Then we went before you transform, as Shelly showed, that it sort of like gives the aha of understanding XFs by doing a Fourier transform to look at the oscillations, uh, the frequencies of the oscillations, the R values of the oscillations. And then after that, we might model that with calculations for uh, the, the XFs. So we, we we will do all of these steps in X, the XAS viewer application in large provides a GUI for doing most of these steps. You can also do this in code as we'll show. Um, and, and that sort of goes to whether you're doing this one at a time or you want to do these a thousand spectra at a time. But we want to be able to do data visualization throughout many of these steps anyway. So do, using it through a GUI and getting started with that is the right thing to do. And then you might want to automate that. But we'll want to like read in the data and then you merge data and data from the data files from every beamline are slightly different and what the channels are called are all slightly different. There's a, there's attempts to codify that and standardize that, but it's it's still uh, pretty pretty unique to each beamline or each, each beamline has a unique data structure. So you need to like be able to read in the data and know how to read that in. That often involves like some work and some interaction with the beamline scientists. Then you need to like get the data normalized and find E0, make sure you're on the right track, then convert it to chi of K here and then convert it to chi of R. And there might be some other things we need to do along the way before we do Sane's analysis like linear, which are mostly based on linear uh, algebra or peak fitting. We might want to do some corrections like deglitching. We might want to align the energies if the if the monochromators were drifting or if we're comparing data between beam lines where the energy calibrations might be different. There are some corrections you might want to make for data collected in fluorescent mode or even in transmission modes, or and you may need to smooth the rebin or merge data together. And each of those steps is it requires a little bit of thought. Uh, most of them are pretty well automated, but um, but often require thought. So Shelly's going to go through like what the buttons do, like just to say you can read in data and like get all these kinds of visualizations from the graphical user interface, um, and we'll go over that in the second half of the morning. So what we want to do to start with is we want to get transmission or fluorescence XFs, and that's like we measured a signal of the ion chamber downstream of the sample, and we measured a signal. 
before the sample I zero and I T or I one, and then we, or we might have for fluorescence we might have measured many channels at the same time, uh, and also in I zero, and we want to like sum those and divide by this. And so it's simple math, but you have to get it right. And if you if you don't if you don't get this right, then your all your analysis kind of suffers. Um, it can suffer pretty badly actually. So the getting these steps right is important, and oftentimes. Once you have a set of data from one beam line, it all works in the same way. So it's not so much that you have to think about this for every time, but you have to think about this for every like sort of data set that you have um, and get the data read incorrectly. And then you may need to do, as we said, you may want to merge data. You often take three to 15 scans at a time and you might want to add those together and merge them so that you're analyzing one spectra that is the sum of them. And you may also then want to make sure the energy is calibrated as the, there may be drift with time at some beam lines, or there may be, or there will be differences between energy calibrations at different beam lines. Um, you, so you might have a reference channel where you measure a, a metal foil, say, downstream of the sample. That's not always possible. So sometimes you measure it once and then measure the samples. And many beam lines these days, there isn't much drift, so you don't need to do this all the time, you might need to do it once a day or maybe once every three days, but you might have a reference channel then to compare data between sessions or beam lines, you'll wanna calibrate the energies and make sure that those are consistently uh, set. The energies are consistently set. Um, we, to, in, order, in order to do Zane's calculations, you want the energies to really line up to better than a half of an EV. And it's often, you often see drifts at that level between scans or between beam lines. So you, you really want these to be finely uh, uh, aligned. Uh, and then sometimes there's there's glitches or jumps in I0. We'll, we'll show you, I think we'll show you some data of that. And you may want to take those out. If they're really bad, it's better to take them out. Those are not valid measurements of mu, so they can be removed or you can just leave them in. They often don't dominate the processing if they're small. And then overabsorption or sometimes called self-absorption in the literature for concentrated samples measured in fluorescence. Um, is an important correction to be able to get the right intensities. So the right uh, intensities for peaks, the right edge positions, because that's often defined by where the derivatives are or where, the, or where half the threshold is, or for analyzing the XFs and getting good uh, numbers for uh, coordination number. Co doing these kinds of corrections can be important. Um, and XAS viewer, as well as Athena and six pack can do all of these steps. And we'll show you how to do these. Um, if you're familiar with any of these other tools, like we're, you know, we're on the same team and we're trying to help. And this is mostly, a, 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 they're all, they all work about the same. So we're trying to get them all to be uh, useful. Okay. So perhaps the most, like the first steps in what you have to do for every specter and often actually the most challenging is this pre-edge subtraction and normalization to get data to be normalized by which I mean, it's zero below the edge. The spectrum is zero below the edge and about one above at, at or above the edge. And this re then represents the absorption from one atom of your iron. Um, and so we do that, we subtract that we fit and subtract a line to a pre-edge, which we measure so that we can do this. Um, that's the only reason we measure the pre-edge is to be able to do this normalization. And then we might try to estimate the edge step, which is not a really well-defined quantity, um, but we might then take a, a line or a curve above the edge and extrapolate it to the edge position to, enter, to E0. And then that's the energy, that, that would be the edge step. And we divide by that so that we get to one. Um, and <clears throat> Finding E0 is generally pretty easy. Not that we know it theoretically well, but we can just take the derivative and that's usually a very reproducible and uh, clear definition of E0, even if it's not like necessarily the threshold of absorption. So when you're talking about theoretic, theoretical comparisons, this might not be, uh, this might be off by a few EV or five or so, but for analysis and for processing, it's a good measure of how to define where the edge is. Um, so we just do that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then, but once, once we do that, we still have to get this, uh, this normalization 
curve. And, and we'll show you that in more detail. It's often like the trickiest, the tricky part, and it comes early. So it's often the most scary uh, part of how to do that. So we, like I showed previously, we might just sort of extrapolate a, a line or a quadratic polynomial. We could also use tabulated values of mu of e. So there are value, there are tables of these numbers that we use for like calculating uh, what the theoretical absorption could be. Those, those are, of course, those don't include any of the fine structure. They don't include any of the edge shifts for, for chemistry uh, changes, but they are pretty good tabulated values of, of the expected decay of mu. Um, there are also instrumental factors that are included in that are included in the tables that do affect our measurements, but those are often smooth. And so we can use these tabulated values from tables like Chandler et al. or other, or Hanke tables or whatever to basically fit that. And then that will give us a pretty good uh, measure of the edge step two. And that's generally pretty, um, I'm gonna say that's pretty consistent. It also is pretty linear over any like, Edge range that we have in the XFs. so it's it's not always perfect, but it's but it's very consistent, and so we can we can do that. There's actually code based from uh, Tsung Wang uh, called the MBAC procedure, uh, and we basically borrow that, and you can use that uh, and these tabulated values from Chandler at all to do the back, to do the normalization also, and it's. It's, uh, I would say it's, it's not necessarily better, but it's more stable. Um, uh, okay. And uh, hopefully we'll get to showing you that. If not, you can ask questions about that. For post-edge background, once we have mu of e, we, we wanna extract the chi of k, we wanna use this differential uh, value. So we want to subtract of some idealized mu that represents the absorption from the bare atom which we have not measured and we will not measure, we do not measure, because um, that would be the idealized atom without any neighbors around it. And that a gas actually is, is in, an interesting thing to measure, but might not be exactly right anyway. Um, we, can, we can talk about that. I'll skip over the theoretical part of that. Um, so we just approximate this mu of zero with a spline, which a spline, a curve that's just a smooth, uh, concatenation of, of, of polynomials that is allowed to have some uh, breaks in their high, higher derivatives. So it's flexible. It's used like just to fit stuff. It has no mathematical meaning of itself, but we can uh, use it to approximate a curve. And of course, doing that would be dangerous. A flexible spline could match mu of e, and that would be bad. So what we want to do is get a spline that matches the low frequency components of mu of e. And this is all codified, and we know how to do this well, or we know how to manipulate the code and tell the computer how to do it consistently anyway. Um, so then we can subtract that and get a chi of e. And the, we don't generally think about chi as a function of, of X-ray energy above the absorption edge. We think of it as the in terms of the photoelectron scattering. So we'll convert that to the photoelectron wave number, or like you know one over the wavelength. So that's the square root of the energy. So that expands the the, the x-axis to uh, like this for for to k from e, and then the oscillations die off quickly with with k. So we'll k weight the spectrum uh, multiplying by k squared or k cubed, sometimes k, k to the first power. You can do more fancy things that we'll get to in a bit, but we'll often multiply by k squared just as a default. So that multiplies the, curve, the, the spectra out here at k of 10 by 100. Um, so you can see that as we go out in k, then you see the noise more, uh, more readily when you've k-weighted it. Uh, and then we'll, we'll want to take this We'll want to take this curve, this chi of k, and we see that it's oscillatory, so we'll want to do a Fourier transform. So we'll, first, we'll, we'll add a window function to sort of smooth out some of the features. This is not super necessary, but it's the way it's it's often the way it's done. So we'll we'll multiply by a window to avoid ringing and artifacts of of truncations, and we'll do a Fourier transform to turn that into chi of r. This is now chi of r, and this is the peaks. This spectrum that I'm showing you is from iron oxide, so iron with oxygens in the first shell and a rock, a rock salt structure. So pretty easy to think about. 
So this is this is the spec. This is the intensity that comes from iron oxygen scattering, and this is the the intensity that comes from iron iron scattering in the second shell. And the peaks here um, look like a radial distribution function, but they're not quite because there's phase shifts as the in the photoelectron scattering, and so these coordination shells are from the iron oxygen and iron iron scattering, but they're not at the the right positions in this R spectra. So they're shifted by about a half an angstrom down. And that's not enough to uh, do the analysis, but it's enough for a ballpark uh, guess of what the distances are. And then the Fourier transform we did was complex. Actually, there's oscillations where this just shows the magnitude. That's the most common view that you'll see in the literature. But when we do the analysis, any analysis of these, we're going to include the oscillatory part of chi R as well. Now, there's both real and imaginary parts. So they're not different because the because the imaginary part of the of chi of k, the thing we measured is zero. So the real and imaginary parts are not distinct. They're just out of phase uh, from each other. Uh, okay, so we might also want to do continue and do what's called Fourier filtering. You'll see this especially in the oldest literature about XFs, where we'll then do another Fourier transform of just isolating this shell, say the iron oxygen shell, and then Fourier transforming that back to K space. And that's the isolated oscillation from iron oxide in this space, in this case. Um, this is a common, this is, has been a common thing to do. It's not really that exciting or useful, but you'll often see this in the literature that people will plot these. Um, when we do the analysis, we can do the analysis either in R or in this, in this filtered, uh, now filtered out, uh, uh, K space. Okay, so that's that's like what I would want to say, and maybe it's best to like uh, stop here and pause for questions. In this in this set of slides, I have a whole lot more details on background subtraction Fourier transforms and a little bit on. Actually, I don't think I have much in on XFs analysis here, but there are a lot. There's more slides that I can show you on the details of this. Um, but I think this is a good time to pause for questions. Um, Shelly, are there any questions? Or I could go into details of this. Uh, Matt, I have a question. Yes. Um, sure. you, showed, you showed two background subtractions, right? And they were or two. I, I'm not exactly sure. I guess that's my. I have a question. You, it, it was lint. It was um, M back and Poly. Yes. yes, and they look the same. And I, 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 maybe that's the point, but I, I didn't quite understand what. Ah, this is to do. This is just for normalization. So when we do the normalization, right? So we track. We can subtract the pre edge line, and then we can take a a curve, usually a line or a quadratic polynomial and just fit it to the above edge and extrapolate that to zero. That's one way to do the normalization. This other way of doing the normalization, and so I would call that the polynomial way of doing the normalization. The other way of doing the normalization is to take our spectrum and fit it to the tabulated values of mu of e. Um, ah, okay, okay. I thought you were already getting into the um, the... Yeah. The XF background subtraction there. Yeah, no. So, the, so this is those are the two different ways of normalizing. I see. I see. Um, okay. Yeah. And again, that I, I like the point there was that the, the polynomial might be more accurate if you work at it hard, but the M back is can, is pretty consistent. Got it. Yeah. So. Um, there's a question from, are there any circumstances where you could use the white line peak as the edge? Would the normalization and analysis still work? Yeah, if you use like the energy of the white line, that's, that can work. Um, I think that uh, it's not that common because to do that, uh, mostly because that position can actually move. It, it might be that for some metals or for some metal oxides, that's a good thing to use. And it's certainly a good energy to know about. Um, but if the ligand changes or if, there, if there's a dramatic change in the coordination environment, that peak intensity can move or it can split or it can, uh, or, or yeah, or, or it can move around in energy. So it often is a good indication of what the, 
local environment is, but I wouldn't call that the threshold of energy. I hope that answers that question, but I'm not sure if it did. <laughs> anyway, Eric, if you, have, if you have like more on that, like let us uh, know. Uh, and then there was another question, uh, or was there any other questions? Um, I don't see any right now. But if you have a question, you want to put that in the chat or in in. Um... Okay, so let me let me go over then, just a little bit here on background subtraction because I think there was questions about that. So when we do this background subtraction spline, um, again we're going to we're going to want to remove that that spline so that we remove the low frequency components of mu of of mu uh, of e. So we have this one parameter that we call a, a distance, r bkg, that says take the Fourier transform and try to remove or reduce all of the components in the Fourier transform below that distance. So if we say r bkg is 0.3 angstroms, <clears throat> we'll get a specter that looks like the blue curve here. And if we put that value up to one, we'll get the red curve. And you can see that actually like for most of the spectrum out above two angstroms, there's, a, there's really tiny differences. There's not any difference at all, but we've removed this, this low frequency component. And here in the chi of k, that's the same thing. And you can see there is, you can see that there's a low frequency component that is there that doesn't really affect the, high, the higher frequencies, but is there. And so some of this is cosmetic. Like we could just ignore that peak. We know it's not real. There's not an, there's not a, atom that has a peak of 0.3 angstroms, I mean, like almost certainly not. Um, uh, so a good rule of thumb is to use a value of about one angstrom or so, or half the nearest neighbor. And don't spend too much time on this because you really don't affect the, the background subtraction for the rest of the spectra. The, the counter argument is actually um, hidden in this data set, which says I, oxygen is the first neighbor. And there's this asymmetric peak that's typical for oxygen. So if you see that, you want to make sure that you don't like start digging into that peak too much because you'll take away the core, the much of that peak. So the real danger is to, is to go too far. Um, so in fact, with this spectra, same spectra, if I make RBKG of two, then that's that gives the green curve. Again, it hasn't really affected the higher uh, frequency, the higher R components, but it has removed effectively the iron oxygen scattering. Um, and in fact, like if you look at that green curve there, it actually looks pretty good. It's just removed like some stuff, but it turns out that that's the iron oxygen scattering that might be the thing that we're the most interested in. Okay. Um, and then there's also Fourier transforms and we like, there's, there's a bunch of information on Fourier transforms. The Fourier transforms are, are new to you or you're like interested, you can go through these and these slides and, and see what, what a Fourier transform looks like in, in, in the different spaces. So here's a sine wave, here's a cosine. And when we Fourier transform, they peak up at the same place, they're just out of phase. But if we change the distance, that pushes it uh, out. And then we have this, oh, and then if we add to, if we take two, uh, uh, oscillatory functions that are nearly the same distance and we add them together, we get this, this beating pattern here. You see the decay and then it starts to grow again as they come back into phase. And then when we Fourier transform that, we, what was two distinct peaks becomes, what was two distinct peaks becomes one broader peak with much lower intensity. Um, and so this is something we'll see in XAPS all the time. And that, that actually then indicates what, uh, what we have to do to be able to resolve two peaks that are close in distance. And that is we need to have them, we need to go out in K far enough to distinguish these two cases. Um, uh, of, is that just a short peak or is it because there's two different frequencies? And so the, the relationship between how far out in K you go and how well resolved you can be in R spaces is clear from, that's well known in Fourier analyses uh, in other fields too. And then we use a, a variety of window functions and we Fourier transform those. And you can go into detail, all the details of this. I would say the important thing for this is just to be consistent and, and not get too hung up on, on how these look different. Uh, there's, lots of, there's, there's lots of choices and they don't make much difference, except for that, but, but K-weighting here, here's different K-weightings for of zero, one, two, and three, again, with the same spectra. And you can see that as we K-weight, we emphasize the high, 
that emphasizes the high K stuff. The high K frequencies are also the, the heavier atoms. So that emphasizes the heavier atoms at the expense of the lighter atoms. Um, and that can all be used for good effect or for or to hide, <laughs> but can also like hide things that you really ought to not hide. Okay. Um, I think that I should allow Shelly to get back in the game where uh, and stop the share. I think if, I, if there's anything I've missed, oh, we can also do wavelet analyses. Uh, like maybe that's an exact, maybe that's an advanced question. Um, and then, yeah, there's more, there's more here of places to look for more information. And why don't I stop sharing and Shelly can go back into the large buttons uh, piece of this. Okay. Are there Hello. any are there are there any questions? Yeah, any other questions for Matt? Uh, feel free to use the uh, chat to everyone or just directly to either of us. It's fine too. Or just unmute yourself and say hello. Any questions there? Okay, so Shelly's going to go over if if that's going to work. Is that going to work, Shelly? Take I over some so. of the some okay. of the buttons. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Let me put my. Here we go. Um, share screen. Listen to presentation. Round again. Okay, so um, I prepared this um, as a uh, as a presentation. Um, we could also do it in in real time, um, but I thought maybe for those of you that have never used um, never used Larch, it's sometimes it's helpful just to uh, kind of get an, a, a large overview of where where and I I. I uh, modified my title because I couldn't do all of them, but uh, some of the buttons in large. And uh, I just wanted to give you um, a flavor. And then uh, this afternoon, we will get into actually using large to show you the um, how, how this is all done in real time. So uh, with that, I'll go to my next slide and also get the pointer and try to go to the next slide. Uh, okay, so this is the XFs viewer. This is what you um, what you will find when you uh, first open Larch. It has um, a, a lot of similarity to um, to Athena. You'll notice that right away. Um, on the we have our um, a few menu items up at the top left, and then a big panel here where you'll see uh, data that you've read into into Larch once you have them um, populated. And then on the right hand side, you have some tabs that allow you to, to have different uh, visualizations of different screens. And it goes all the way from normalization all the way to the FEP fitting uh, directly in one uh, application here. Um, up at the top is how you can plot the data. You can either plot data, um, plot the current group that's highlighted on the left side, or you can plot um, selected groups by checking a checkbox next to their names. And uh, the type of spectrum that you show, there's a pull down menu with lots and lots of options here. I'll show that in, in a minute. Um, the next step, the next region here is all about, um, it's all about the uh, data set and um, the energy shift value, the, e, the value for E0 on the absorption edge, and the edge step that is uh, calculated for you to normalize the, um, the data. Uh, the next region here is about the pre-edge range. Um, this tells you which uh, data above the absorption edge is used to determine that uh, that spline, if you uh, if you will, and then oh, I'm sorry, this is pre edges before the absorption edge, and then the normalization uh, method and range is shown in 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 this part uh, here. All right, 
So maybe the first thing you want to do is read in some data. So that's what I'm, uh, I'm showing you here. You go up into the file menu, open a data file that brings up this dialogue shown on the right hand side, where you have uh, quite a few different options. And uh, Matt alluded to this being one of the most tricky parts um, of, of reading the data into, um, into large. And so um, one thing I would, I would notice is the data type up here in the top right. So this is, uh, this is raw data type, which is actually not quite right. Uh, I wanted it to be um, um, absorption data, which is another option shown here. So that's uh, actually, you wanna make sure that your data, if it's absorption data is not uh, raw. And uh, this is the array that you can use to, uh, to make your data set. So this data happens to be in columns of XMU already. And so it's just XMU divided by one. And uh, this is the name of the, of the data file. And there wasn't a reference for this uh, data since it was a platinum foil. But if you uh, did have a reference, you would check that box here as well. And very nicely, uh, there's a plot window that gives you a preview of what that data is going to look like. And that's great to let you know if you have a problem with uh, some of these uh, values shown here. All right. The next one is um, how to determine that edge step. So uh, now you can see on the left-hand side, I've read in a few different uh, data sets. This one is the platinum foil that's highlighted in blue. So that's the current plot. It's also the selected uh, group because it has a checkbox here. And I've chosen to uh, plot mu of e plus the pre and post edges. And so you can see that here in the plot, the mu data is in the blue curve, the pre-edge is the uh, dotted red, and the post edge is the dotted uh, green. And then the edge step is calculated by the difference between those two curves at the value for E0, which is shown as the, as the red bullet point um, here. Um, all right. So that's how you can inspect your data and determine if the, um, if the edge step is a uh, reasonable value for, for the data set. Uh, next, you'll want to uh, show, the, um, show the normalized data. And um, you can do that by... Um, choosing uh, to plot the selected groups with just one, or you can use the other group button. I did, I did it that way. And you can see now that the pre-edge is at zero, the post-edge comes up to the value of one, and um, it's uh, properly normalized um, mu of E data. So if you're used to, um, used to Athena, oftentimes we use this uh, flatten function. And um, so normalized mu of e doesn't take uh, doesn't flatten the um, the the data above the absorption edge, so you can still see that it uh, decreases um, a little bit as the absorption coefficient should above the absorption edge. Right, you should have less of less absorption by the uh, sample. But if you want to do that, you still can, and so. Um, that's uh, shown here as flattened mu, and then it uh, makes the data uh, go along uh, one above the absorption edge. It takes, takes that out, out of the spectrum. Sometimes this is useful when you have a uh, spectra that you're trying to compare that are measured in very different methodologies like fluorescence and transmission. Um, sometimes the the, uh, the absorption above the edge is a little bit uh, curved in a way that uh, you want to take that out. And so that's sometimes helpful. The next step is often to align the data. So I'm going to uh, just show you wh what, that, uh, what that looks like. So um, it brings open another uh, panel shown here where you can choose um, the group that you want to um, calibrate. 
And if you want to auto align it to another uh, reference spectrum, so right now I'm, I'm aligning this reference for the platinum clusters to the platinum foil shown here. I'm going to plot that as the derivative. And then um, you, can, um, you can determine an energy shift. And you can save that as a new group or overwrite the current group. Um, I actually had to, uh, just for demonstration purposes, I shifted this uh, data by two EV, so you could see that there are actually two different curves here. And so the platinum foil is the, um, is the green dashed uh, derivative, which is underneath the shifted one, which is blue. And then the original data set that I'm aligning to it is shown as the, uh, the red uh, curve with the dotted lines. And the bars here very nicely show you where uh, the derivative crosses zero so that you can see um, that, that value uh, very easily here in this, in this uh, display. All right. So that's how you can align uh, one spectrum to another spectrum. Uh, and then either overwrite the group or save it as a new group and you can give it a name. You can also uh, go ahead and um, uh, select groups with a shared reference or apply the shift to selected groups. So you can apply it to, to a, a bunch of data. Okay, the next one is a little bit about the XF's background function. Um, so you can plot that. Uh, you need to go over to the uh, the XFs curve. So the or the tab. The first tab is all about normalization. So this one is about the uh, chi of k data. It's called XFs tab. And here we have different uh, menu items for what can be plotted. Um, in this example here, I'm plotting the mu of e and then the background function. Um, is shown in red. And um, so the background subtraction of, uh, section is in the middle here where you have your value of E0, the RBKG value that Matt uh, showed you where you can change the, um, the amount of bendability of the spline, making it more or less uh, bendable so it can follow the data or not. The, the spline range in k min to k max, the k weight. And then there's also some clamp uh, options here, which will tell you at the very beginning and end how strongly to uh, follow the, the data um, if you want to. The next section is about the Fourier transform. So going from chi of k to r, there's the k range, the k weight, and the window. And then finally, the back Fourier transform, if you want to Fourier filter um, just a, a certain section. And I also uh, show a little bit about uh, changing this value for RBKG and the effect it has on the background function. And that's shown here in this next uh, slide. So we're changing that um, the amount of uh, Curvature allowed to the background, and you can see here in this example in the top left, um, we have more curvature for the background, and uh, this one here uh, has less. And uh, you have a really strong peak right here at the white line. And then down here on the bottom left, I show the uh, difference in the chi of k data. And really, as Matt uh, mentioned previously, this doesn't really make much difference at all to the chi of k data above about two and a half angstroms. And that's often the lowest value that we use in the Fourier transform. And so it doesn't really affect the data very much at all. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about uh, the RBKG value, especially if you're just getting started with your data set. You want to uh, choose a value that's around one or um, half the first shell distance. Okay. Um, another choice that uh, needs to be made, it made for um, preparing the chi of k data is the choice of E0. Um, this uh, choosing the, the middle point that's shown here in the middle one, that's the uh, maximum of the first derivative and that's the default value. That's usually a really good, a good idea. I just wanted to show this example where 
I did the extremes. I went to the very bottom of the absorption edge and I also went to the very top of the absorption edge. I mean, really you wanna make sure that that uh, E0 is somewhere on the absorption edge. It does, this different choice does make a difference in uh, the background right through the absorption edge. And this is, this is a tricky part because the absorption is changing quite rapidly, right? The absorption edge is going straight up and then it's gotta go horizontal. And so you've got to bend through these first through oscillations right above the absorption edge, which is kind of tricky. You can see that it does, uh, changing E0 on the absorption edge does change this, uh, the way that background goes through those first few slices. And if you, if you push E0 up high enough, you can actually push the chi of k data a little bit. It's emphasized more at low k and less at high k, but you can push it a little bit. But the, uh, the important uh, thing again here is that the Fourier transform is, is relatively insensitive to all of this. Um, because we don't use this very low K part of the Fourier transform. And um, when you fit the data, you often vary the value of E0. And so it can account for this small shift um, at low K as well. So um, I have some ideas there. And uh, my last, uh, or one of my last examples here um, for processing data in um, to chi of k is the back Fourier transform. And um, that's shown, uh, the values are shown here. You can uh, back Fourier transform just uh, a single peak in the data and see what frequencies um, that are, are, are included in that uh, signal that's shown here. I like to always show this on top of the uh, chi of k data, which is red. That's the entire um, original data set. The Fourier filtered or back Fourier transform chi of q just of the first shell is shown in blue. And you can really see how it has just a single frequency. And all these decorations with the higher frequency data have, have been removed. But if you increase the um, back Fourier transform range to include all of that, those higher frequency components, then you can very nearly match the, the initial data. And here you can also see the effect of the Fourier transform windows and the K range on the Fourier transform data because you, you don't have uh, this very low K or the very high K has not been uh, included because of the, uh, the window and the K range that you, you've, you've chosen. So that's the three to 14.2. And then the window as well uh, gradually brings this up and you can see that as well. So there's a, the, the back Fourier transform has a little bit less amplitude here compared to the original because of the window function. All right. Uh, the next step is a little bit about uh, FEF fitting in large. Um, are there any questions on this first part before I go into that? I don't know. It looks like maybe there's a question or two in the chat. Maybe. Maybe not. I answered a couple of questions in the oh. chat, but um, okay. but if George or Deborah want to, if that wasn't clear for George or Deborah and they want to ask. That's, that's okay. okay. Well, I have a follow-up question. So does that mean that I could import like an, an alignment scan in Larch and actually, cause I know in Athena, I can't do that. Is, is that something that Larch could handle? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. That's nice. That's why, that's why, that's why we do it too. <laughs> because you want to see those, you know, alignment scans or, or what we're doing, what we're doing Herfty, like we'll do scans of emission and you want to be able to read that in at least to visualize it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, following up on the George's question is, uh, are you going to show this? I'm sure Matt could do it for us. I don't think I, I want to I do will, it on the fly, but Matt will do it on the fly. I'll put I'll, you on the I'll, fly. I'll see if I can find something. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> or if you, can, if you can share data, yeah, find, find an alignment scan for us, I'll, somebody. I'll go, I'll, go, I'll go dig one up while she oh, finishes her. Okay. Yeah. Well, after yeah. this yeah. one, we're 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 set to take like a, a short break anyway. Ah, break. Great. So so we can find some data. But so yes, we'll do it. Yeah. We'll find yeah, yeah. Data. Okay, yeah. that sounds good. All right. Okay. So uh theft fitting in large. How does that work? 
Okay, so uh, one of the first things to do bes besides getting your data ready and getting the Chi of K data is to get a, I don't know, is to get a FEF calculation. Oh, and this is a little bit blurry. So up in uh, the menu, you can choose uh, FEF and you can do uh, browse your SIF structures and run FEF. And then that will bring you uh, to this page here where you can search uh, for um, a, a, a mineral name or a, or a or, or, or uh, you have very, many different options for what you can uh, search for. And you can include elements and exclude elements. And I, I have to say, Matt, this is one of my favorite parts of, um, of LARCH is that this database is just there. And so um, oftentimes it's uh, difficult and takes time consuming to find uh, different crystal structures, but uh, to run, um, to run atoms and run FEF. And for large, um, it, uh, Matt's database has largely uh, removed that issue. So uh, it's really, really handy. So you can, um, once you um, once you do a search, uh, it'll give you a whole list and um, you can interrogate them in different ways. You can uh, look at the text file of the SIF. You can um, look at the XRD pattern and, um, once you run uh, run FEF, you're um, presented with a list of paths, um, and the paths have different color codings, of course, as as, as usual, and uh, they're numbered consecutively. Shown here, the um, the half path length is shown as R, and then the number of legs. So the blue paths are single scattering paths. Uh, the red ones are multiple scattering paths. And then the focus paths, which are often very important, are shown uh, in the blue color. And uh, the number of paths, that's the degeneracy shown in the next column, and then the importance. Um, so this is just a quick, um, calculation that compares the uh, amplitude of the other paths to the first uh, path. So the first one is always 100, but then you know that this second path is about um, a quarter uh, of the intensity of the first one. It gives you some idea of how important the different paths are. And then once you, um, once you do that, you come back to your uh, uh, to your um, large interface to bring that uh, FEF path into the fitting, you need to go back up into the FEF uh, calculation and do browse um, FEF calculations. And that will uh, bring you back to that same list, but now you are able to select this uh, um, use button and import the paths. And so um, that's how you'll actually get it assigned in the um, in your in your uh, FEF fitting page, if you will. So um, so that's kind of a two step process. The first step is to run the FEF calculation, and then the second one is to browse and import the path directly. Once you um, once you do that. You can look at the um, at the FEF fitting uh, page uh, shown here, and um, th th Matt has very nicely um, added a hint here uh, to add paths. Use the FEF browse FEF calculation. So that's up here in this menu, and uh, that's how you get that path to show up. And I've already included that first platinum platinum path, and it'll show up down here in the bottom. And um, it will automatically get the uh, the usual XF's parameters will automatically get populated with uh, reasonable values. Uh, there's a label that tells you what the core and uh, scattering atom type is, and then uh, a, a series of digits that corresponds to the reference path length. So this one is 277 because the reference path length is 2.77. The amplitude is uh, the coordination number of 12 times S0 squared, and then E0, and then there's a delta R to change the half path length, and then a sigma squared value um, is shown here. 
the um, if you click on the left uh, tab here for parameters, it will show you uh, all of these values and um, uh, it shows you the parameter name and the value and then the type so you can change between varied and fixed and defined. And then it also gives you a nice interface for defining some bounds on, uh, on these values if you want to. So um, for example, uh, this one, delta R has a custom bound uh, between minus 0.7 and plus 0.7. Uh, sigma squared and E zeros don't have any bounds on them right now. And then sigma squared needs to be uh, positive and somewhere between zero and one. And right now we're gonna vary all, uh, all four of those. If you need to edit this parameter list, you need to take uh, some parameters out or in, you would click this button for edit parameters up at the top. And that brings you to another dialog box where you can um, select them, or remove them or add a parameter just by hand. And so um, that, that's also another uh, handy, um, handy uh, interface function. Okay, so next, uh, looking at the results of running a fit, um, here is the, uh, here's the magnitude and the Fourier magnitude of the data and the model for the platinum foil. You can um, interrogate that in a, in a bunch of different ways using the plotting features. The model, of course, is shown in red and the data is in blue. And then you have, um, this is the standard um, a fitting results page. It has the features for plotting the data and the fit in lots of different ways. And then it shows you the statistics on the fit. Um, so this one was done, you can see uh, yesterday at 5.30, getting ready for this uh, meeting. Um, the number of paths, the number of variables, number of independent points, chi-squared, the reduced chi-squared, and the R factor. And um, down here at the bottom, we see our variables, the best fit va values, and the standard error that's uh, shown here as well. All right, if you open up the um, uh, show uh, path parameters button, that'll bring you to a, another report, which is uh, similar to maybe what you're used to in, um, in Artemis. And it gives you a lot of the details of um, how the data was processed and again, list uh, those parameters and further down, you'll actually see the, um, the values for each one of the, um, each one of the, the path parameters. Okay. So I think that brings me to the end of this, um, the end of this one, I would say uh, my next slide here is that uh, Larch has all the features that you need to uh, process XF spectra. And I encourage everyone to start using it. And here's the URL to get to it if you haven't already. Okay, so that's my section. Uh, are there any other questions? Let's see, uh, <clears throat> Valerie asked, if it's better to align or to calibrate, I've heard both. Um, yeah, I, there's, okay. Typically, there's not a lot of difference. You can take two sets of spectra and align them, but you need to know that they're the same thing. So that's if they're the same thing, then that's kind of calibration. So if you take two foils, you know, two iron foils or zinc foils or whatever you're looking at, um, could be antimony or vanadium and align those. And then typically you will have measured those reference foils uh, at the same time as your data. And depending on the beam line, that might be every scan or it might be every day or every run. And you'll then you'll want to say, I want to make sure all of the, the vanadium scans from this run and the vanadium scans from this set of data are consistent. So, mer so make sure that the two vanadium spectra are aligned. So align those two, but then you should bring all of the other spectra with it. So that vanadium foil would be the reference for a 
other scans, maybe one other scan or maybe a lot of other scans, but it would be the reference for some of those. And then you bring all of those when you, when you change the energy of your vanadium foil. And then those would all be calibrated and aligned. Uh, is, I hope that helps. Um, ah, Jeremy, Jeremy corrects, that's, that's calibration is, is essentially a single point while alignment is based on the energy range. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we, we, when we do the alignment, we, we do a fit so that the two spectra overlap. And then like the, you know, then you calibrate to say that the iron K or iron foil first derivative should be at 7110.75 or whatever. Right. Whatever value you believe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's right. Yeah. 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 So so in this example, just to kind of emphasize that point, oftentimes when you um when you calibrate, you're just looking for like the maximum of the first derivative and you use that point and uh, shift it so that it's at the value that you want it to be at. Whereas when you're aligning, oftentimes you're matching the whole shape of the spectrum to the, of the reference to the, um, to, to, the, to the other spectrum, if that makes sense. All right, I think there's a question about, is there a way to view the spline function or equation using or, or to export the values of the function to plot it separately? There is, I mean, there is a, an array called BKG that's, that's one of the things you can plot when you're looking at the background subtraction. So you can get that plot of mu or normalized mu with the, background function going through it. For the actual spline function, the equation, th that is available in the code. Um, and I think uh, it's probably better to have the array of data. So there, what Shelley shows here on this plot, that red curve, it's, a, you know, it's an array of data. Um, I guess I might add that like, if, you're, if you're interested in the details of like the, how to get that spline curve either we you could like we can talk about that offline or or by email or something and jeremy asks can you yes can can you jeremy asks if you can import fef paths from a fef calculation done outside of xas viewer and the, yes you can um uh in fact like this is similar to artemis that like XAS viewer keeps a FEF folder and it runs FEF inside that folder. And then it knows to look in that folder for FEF, for FEF n and n dot dat files. But if you want to go find another one, you can either like bring that into that folder or calculate them separately. Right. I'll also say that like Shelly showed this database and actually recently, and this is like also like recently um, it, someone else, added the ability to take structures from other programs. So like uh, structures from DFT or MD calculations or X, XYZ spec, uh, data sets uh, of structures and turn those into FEF files too with a similar, very similar, um, we're, using, we're using code from the Montreal's project, the uh, Montreal's genome project to do that conversion of structures into FEF input files and that works for then VASP or other DFT calculations. Um, and, and the folder of FF results, like you can play with that. And, and yes, it doesn't need to be part of this data set. Let, let me add, like, well, I guess we're gonna go to break, but let me add on that, Jeremy. But, all, but also when you save up, when you save a session, like a project file, when you save a session that saves that FEF dot dat file in the project so that that goes with the data that goes with that and you don't need to read it again from your folder so you can then send that session to somebody else or move it to a different computer and that fef dot dat file will be retained it also it also keeps i believe it keeps the fef input file but not the rest not the stuff it didn't use 
Um, okay. Uh, and that's just so you can mail around these session files or you know archive them or have them in supplemental material in your paper. Um, and then, okay, so then is er the error bar reported in large using the same algorithm? Yes. The answer is yes. Actually, it does. So the error bar is, uh, it's using all the same algorithms. It's all the least squares, nonlinear least squares, Levenberg more part. Um, it's actually a little better in, in ways. And their error bars in, in the XF fitting, so the FEFIT fitting, um, Autumn better include the uncertainties in from the background subtraction process. So I would say slightly better, but only, you know, same algorithm. Yes. Yeah, Should we really take a good break? question. Yeah, let's take those, a those break. Are, no, those are great questions. Yeah, like, so for all of you people who ask it, like, these are sort of like, not like, I, I'm sorry that we were presenting like how to like divide I0 by I1. And that kind of <laughs> like, it, well, I mean, yeah. So like, just like to be clear, like those, it's often like the, you have to go back through everything every time. Cause like, then you get the, anyway, <laughs> right. Nothing, it turns out nothing is simple. Um, so, but these are these are great questions and like we'll, we can continue on with that. Um, okay, so after the break, we're gonna do like least squares analysis and maybe some pre edge peak fitting. But if you have questions or suggestions, go for it. Anything else, Shelly? No, it's good. So I guess the only question left is what time should we come back? It's about five minutes after 10 right now. Should we do a 10 minute break or a 15 minute break? What do you think? Anybody have a? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say 15 minutes. I'll, okay. I'll be back in 10 minutes, but we can be, we can start answering questions again in 10 minutes, but then okay. we'll just start okay. in 15. Okay. 15. See you, see you later. Okay.
Zoom recording. Hi, everyone. We're back from break, and we're going to do um, some live data reading, in, inputting of data, and some, and then getting to some Zane's analysis steps. We'll do start with linear combinations, maybe some PCA work. Um, but I thought I would start with um, this question about reading in non-XFS data. And I'll just show you a couple examples, but also say as like as I'm starting this. So in in this folder, there's some non-XAS data, um, and some of that is actually in energy space. Like this scan is in energy space, but it's an emission XF scan. So here it's it will say that it's of type XF because it sees that the energy is values in electron volts, which is how I collected it. But it's actually data that's that's of like the emission scan energy over the analyzers as I'm aligning analyzers. So you can read that in. And if I if I say that this is not XFs data, but raw data, then, and I say, okay, then these should probably be this grayed out. But what happens is that the choice of plotting becomes raw or scaled or derivative or derivative and scaled. And so I can say derivative of that, if you want to see that, it's noisy. And then here's a scaling value. So if you have multiple ones of them, you can show the scaled value. So you can rescale line scans or plot scans. So I'll just do a couple more here that we have. These are, this is a scan that we would do for a beam damage test. Um, so that's some of iron K alpha as a, with, a dummy, with a dummy motor, right? And we just want to read that in. And again, that knows then it, that it's raw data. I also say that, okay, and then, but then like, and here's just some general data from my data fitting program. We have this data that is, that looks crazy here. Actually, if we look at the text file part of that, this data file has columns. Um, it's from this from the 1970s and Y is first and then X is, first, and then X comes. So I, I know that I want to say the X array is actually the second column and then Y is that one. And that's what the data is supposed to look like. And you can read that. And again, you can like take those in and say, I have these two and I want to plot them as in raw data. And like the scales are totally different. So you might scale the data. Anyway, the X axes are also totally different. Um, so just plot those two. That's derivative and that's raw data, that kind of thing. So you can read, you can read in alignment scans and you don't have to like worry about, nothing else will work, but um, you can at least visualize the data. Okay, so I'll, I'll, and, oh, right, I, I was gonna mention, I mentioned it to Shelly that uh, we also have, there's also a special reader for the data from ESRF, which um, they use, they used to use spec and now they use a different program to collect their data, but they still go into a, a file that's spec-like, that is that scans are concatenated into the same file. And then they actually convert that to HDF5. And we can read in those files and then you have a selection. So then it's like a, a group of files and you can read in that selection and pick out which scans you want from that. So I'm gonna remove these selected groups move those groups and then go on. Cause we could also, so reading in raw data, I'm gonna go find some raw data. So I have some raw data, here it is. And like, this is just somebody's data. And this is like real data for iron from our beam line. Like if I read that in, pull that in, energy is in, in energy, but I wanna go find the right columns, right? So I want some of iron K alpha, that's our, that's our, from this was when we had a four element detector. So there's each one individually. You could read each one individually if you want as different groups. Um, there's also a dead time factor. There, this data has a little bit of dead time uh, correction, but we this is then the sum of, of I and K alpha. And then we want to divide by I zero. Um, so we'll just read it. So that's that's how you would read in data, right? That's And in fact, once I've done that for one data set, this is, would be the common thing. Then I want to do it for a bunch more. Um, just read in all of those, and it will remember the choice, the previous choices. So it'll say I and K alpha, the same channel divided by I zero. So just that you get those. I, I guess I should show you the text files of these. These are data from RB1, which are like ASCII columns, and they're huge. And there's tons of, there's many, many rows of data. Um, I think that's sort of the most common for the APS and for, Beamlines in the US. I, I, I should go back and 
read in one of the files from the non-XFs data. I've labeled it non-XFs, but it's actually is, was XFs data. It was just measured at, at Photon Factory in Japan and it's, and it's energy. It, here it says it's raw data, but it's not. It's data that's collected with the x-axis is the monochromator angle. So I want to say that it's x-axis, but I want to tell it that it's the energy is in or the x-axis is in degrees. And then if I look at the text file, in that text file is actually encoded that the despacing used for the monochromator is 3.11553. Uh, that's good. I so that, that's a little different than what we have for the default. So I might change that. That will change it a little bit. And then if I go read column four, which looks a little weird, but in column five, then we have normal, actually take the log that way. That's normal mercury data at 12.4. And it even says that it's the mercury cis. So you can read in data from in, you know, other, other B mod. So again, as I was saying, from ESRF, we read in, we have a reader for HDF5 data. Um, and if there are other formats from the data collection systems that you have that either you want specialty or readers or to be able to adapt what we have, it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna get rid of this one group just cause then I can select all stuff. So I'll remove that one group. So Matt, data. Matt yes. how, how, uh, how, generic do you think that HDF5 reader is? Because HDF5 is, um, the structures of those files are pretty uh, specific. Um, right. could, I guess the H, I guess there's a question here from Eric about um, 12 BM that also does HDF5 files. So I don't know what HDF, I, I don't know about, so I know that the data that was collected at 12 BM uh, a few years ago in app, like is files of ASCII, we could read. If you have data from 12 BM that's in some format, just send it to me and we'll see if we can get it read in. To the, okay, so the, the other question, um, the ESRF folks have a data format for in HDF5. And yeah, so HDF5 is a generic, like just a, directory of stuff and then you have to know where to find stuff. We can read in the HDF5 ones from ESRF. Actually, when I collect X-ray fluorescence maps, it might be one that also uses HDF5. We can read in those, but like it also knows how to find stuff and that's not XFS data, but it, there are programs for that. There's actually an effort and I, I called Nexus to like ex establish good tags for for different data sets and we're, I've kind of got roped into like working toward um, working on the definition so that we have a common like schema in the HDF5 file to, to be able to encode XF data and, and then know how to read it. Um, so generic reader for HDF, I'm not quite, we could probably get something like that, um, but we can definitely read in HDF5. And if you have specific data from a BMON, we can definitely make that work. And, and even other, other data formats too. Um, Hard. It's not that hard, but also like basically any ASCII file is, is probably supported pretty well. So, okay, so, so Matt, uh, just mm -hmm. a real quick back on that. Um, so in Athena, there were these plugins that uh, you could enable that would en allow you to use the actual reader. Does uh, Larch work similarly with the plugins? It, it doesn't. It, it has a sort of a different way of thinking about that, um, but we could definitely get better. Uh, it has a different thought about plugins. Um, where, but if you write, if you write a reader um, for your data file in in uh, in Python that is can create a dictionary of groups or you know a two D data set, then we can wrap that pretty easily. Um, whether that can be done on the fly dynamically so that someone could write their own and have that specific to their computer, that might be something to think about. Um, so far, we've been trying to solve the problem more generally, um, but, but maybe. Um, th there, are, there are things that we can do like that are, that are plug-in like uh, 
but it's a little different than it's put together a little differently than that from Athena. Anyway, okay, so let me get back to this. So we have, we've read in a bunch of data and like this is real data and it's kind of messy and some of this, some of the scans are kind of like not great. This is, this is, I think there was even a question about like, what do you do with real data that, that does this? How do you normalize this? Right. <laughs> this is a bit of a mess. So, the, I, so um, not to pick on anyone, including the person who like, where we took this data. Actually, this is data, this is actually fluorescent data from map, from mapping. So these are all the spots that we selected. So these are, you know, micro beam measurements. Um, well, let me, if I just take these first three, like, and plot those together, those look pretty good. And I might just say, let's just add those together. And the normalization is not perfect, but that's okay. Cause when I do group, merge the selected groups, it's gonna add those three. And I'm gonna just say, do that with the raw mu of E data. And then it's gonna make up a group name. And I might just edit that to be like spot one, merge three. Um, and then now we have this data set. And in fact, if I, if I click on this, there's a group journal, which I think Shelly alluded to, and that shows that like, this is the, like it came from those three groups and then it starts to do the, what calls it made to pre-edge. So is this, we start working with that group, that journal will fill up for all the processing steps that happened to it. And now we have that data set and it's pretty good. Actually, you can see uh, though in all of these that there's this thing here, this little itty bitty glitch that's right there. And so I'm gonna go, like click on one of these, because for one of these, I'm going to say plot normalized with I0. And in fact, with this data set and at this beam line, um, they're right there at 7262 or something. There's a glitch and it kind of shows up. It's not a disaster, but it's not great. So I might go back to this pre-edge. And, and I'll, I, actually, I should show when I do that, this merge data set doesn't have I0 because it merged the raw data and it didn't drag one of the uh, I zeros along with it. That's a open open question. Um, so I might de glitch that data. So I'll go here to data, and the first menu item is de glitch the data. And now I can go like sort of zoom in and like pick a point. So I'm going to click on the I, the little pin, select a point from the plot, and that's then go over here and click like that one. Um, and that's seventy two sixty seven. That looks right. And remove that point. And now it didn't remove the point. Um, <laughs> of course it didn't remove the point. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, let me try that with the one that's not merged, just to try, <laughs> you know, of course it's not gonna work when you, when you, you know, want it to work in a demonstration. Remove that point and it didn't work. I don't know what's going on. Uh, save as a new group, does that work? Nope, that totally botched. I don't know what's going on. Something's wrong. <laughs> okay, you can de-glitch the data. Okay, remove this group, remove this group. Uh, yes, I don't know what happened. Come back to this. Okay, so we have that group. We might go to the next set uh, and look at these three. And you can see in this these three data set that plot those together and there's like a little bit of a jump in one of these so i might just like not include that one and just say let's merge those two and merge those two uh group merge uh, groups merge those two groups uh merge two of them yes and and so on um i won't get too far along with that so then we have those two groups and we can say let's Select none of them. It's like these two. And plot those together, and the the normalizations aren't great. So I might want to go check that. So let's go look at this one by itself, and plot the pre edge line and the post edge line. I mean that looks like it's decent, except for the pre edge line kind of goes up, and it like that's sort of weird for fluorescence. Maybe it's real, but let's look at that one. That's also going up, but now the data slopes down. I'm not sure why that is. Um, and but we can play with the energy ranges. So I might say, let's make this go from my, minus 100. Well, let's move that in a bit, minus 90, and actually move this one out a bit um, so that it's even further down the down the edge, so that it's flatter. 
Um, and I'll copy that to both of these groups so that both of those have the same sets. And then above the edge, we're doing the polynomial and it's quadratic. We can change that to linear. That, that I doubt that will make much of a difference because the data really is drifting by itself. But we can do that and we can also push this 150 up to 200 volts above the edge and then not go to the end of the data set, but ignore any of the parts that might be um, and again, now that we've done that, those two still look like they're going to be very different just because the data like drift differently. Um, but they're both reasonably well normalized. So I'm okay with that, especially if we're going to do the analysis over only the first, you know, 30 or so volts. Like those look pretty similar. The, you might say that the, the pre-HP intensities are a little different, but also that like the above edge is actually a little different also. Okay. And, and clearly I need to work on, figure out what's wrong with the glitching that, that broke recently. I don't know what happened. Um, okay, so that's that part. Is there anything else we need to show? Uh, we, you can smooth data, rebin, calibrate the energy, change the energies. I'll say for all of these data sets, when you read in a data set and it doesn't have a energy reference, it calls itself its own re energy reference, but you can change that so that one scan be can become the reference for any other scans, um, which I think is pretty typical for data collected the APS where you might say the monochromator is stable enough to um, measure the flow once a day or once every few hours. Um, okay, so let me go. So if that's, I think that might be good for reading and data. We could, some of this data, I think we could try to do background subtraction on, but I think we'll use other data for that. So let me get rid of all of this data or I'll just like clear the clear this session. Um, that's like just, um, just totally clear the memory and the session and read in some other data. And here I'll go find uh, the Zane's data on iron oxide. So this is this is data from that Bruce Ravel took and used in a publication many years ago now looking at gold and cyanobacteria. So this is an Athena project. We'll just read in from that. When you do that, you can pick which, which specter you want out of the Athena project. I'll just select them all. Um, and we have, so, that, but now I also want to like read all, I will check, because I think I just did this from the, from the original Athena project file. And I think I want to go through and, and, check all the normalizations on these. Because if I select every one and look at uh, the normalized, it's also this, and this is a common thing we see that like the data is pretty good in the Zanes region, but it sort of is all over the place in the, if you go far enough out. Um, so I'm gonna look at, so I wanna look at some of these uh, for the pre-edge and especially in this Zanes region, I'm going to make this be not minus 30, but minus 50, because it's pretty broad uh, for the, the gold edge is pretty broad. And I think we want that flatter. I think doing that actually helps make that a little more uniform. I might make this like bring this down to maybe the, to avoid. Uh, often, we often see in many scans from many demons that the first couple of points are not as good as the rest. Um, so get rid of get rid of the first few points. And now that's already looking better. There might be one or two that's a little bit out of alignment, but now I can go back to this, to the normalization part. And if I just plot one of these, um, you can see that it went from pretty close. So 150 is maybe pretty close to the edge. So let's increase that a bit. And then we don't need to go that far out. We don't, or we're just gonna ignore the data out past 600 EV anyway. So let's just make sure that those are all the same. And now if I plot everyone normalized, that's actually a little worse, isn't it? Ah, because I wanted to like make it not, not cubic, but quadratic or linear even. Um, copy those. And now that's looking a little better. Maybe, maybe it was better to have this be 150. I'm always playing with these values to make these look a little bit tighter. And maybe well, we could try quadratic if, this, if we're not happy with this. Let's try quadratic. 
And you got to apply. You got to apply to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's looking a little better because now, so it, they're still diverging out there, and a few like it looks like there's a few different ways they diverge. But if I just focus in on the first few hundred EV around the spectrum, around the edge, they actually look pretty good. There might be one or two that I want would want to like redo by hand. Um, I guess I should all uh, if I on the plot when there's a lot of things plotted, you can click on the label and it will turn out them on and off. So there's one data set here that looks noticeably uh, out of out of character with the others for how well um, normalized it is. So I might just like go look at that one, number 33, um, and tweak its, just tweak that one. Ah, see that one's swooping up. So I might say that, let's say that one should be linear. And now if I plot them all, does that make that better? That makes it a little better, uh, so. That one had to be treated specially because it was a little odd. So we'll just leave it like that for now. And, and now the question is, um, can we do linear combination analyses for these spectra? So here, the, these ones with the names or the ones with the, the, five, the data sets with, that are numbered are just, that's the unknowns. And then they ran a bunch of model compounds. Um, so if we just look at the model compounds, so if I go here and do, you could say select none above. And these are just then the model compound. Ah. Click on that. These are the model compounds. And we might want to say that one of these, each of these spectra, let's say number 703, is some combination of those. <clears throat> so there's a you we could go over here and in, into the linear combination uh, panel and say between or in using normalized data between 11875 and 12015, we want to take some group of data and see if this is a, a combination of those. So we have a lot here. I'm going to be just a little judicious in, in which ones I want. So there's gold chloride and there's gold chloride aqueous. In fact, if I go back and just look at those two, uh, these two are pretty similar. Those are pretty similar. And then like the th everything with a thio in it and the sulfide, like those are pretty similar. Not like okay, the like those are pretty similar. So I don't know that we actually need like we're going to be able to tell that that there are multiples of those in these spectra. But so I might just take like sort of one representative, a sulfide, cyanide, hydroxide, and one of the chlorides. So I plot those together. Okay, now we have a sort of a lot of variation. So I might just say, let's, let's just start with that naively. Let's just take those sets. So use selected groups as components. So I'm going to say, oh, I want the foil too. Use selected groups as components, right? So foil, chloride, hydroxide, cyanide, and sulfide. And then take this, go to one of these spectra. I'm just picking one at random and say, fit this group. So it's going to start with a guess of 20% of each. And then it will bring up this, this uh, results page that shows uh, a bunch of fits. I should fix this too uh, on Windows. It's like, okay, here's fit number one, which has foil, chloride, hydroxide, sulfide. And fit number two, it actually went through all the permutations of, set, of sets of three and four and fit them all. And then ranks them by chi-square. So which one is best? Um, and these look, they all look like decent, but they also, for this set of data, um, they're not perfect. Like this data set has something else going on. So there might be something that we're missing here, but you can see that like concluding here that you have 25% metal and, and a good amount of chloride and a little bit of hydroxide and sulfide would be totally reasonable. And you could definitely also say then, okay, so select none and select all of these and do the same do the same kind of fit to all of the groups. So same data range with these as the, as the standards fit these. And you could allow an energy shift. I would shift the unknown to match the energies. I'm gonna like leave that off. These are pretty well calibrated, but it, you could allow that to happen. Fit all combinations, I'll say yes. And then you could also force the weighting to be some to be one. I tend to leave that off and then use whether the sum is actually one to, to it, as a 
check of sanity or goodness of fit. So in fact, for this set here, for this data set, I didn't force the sum to be one, but here the sum is 1.004. So that's pretty good. And like all of these are pretty good at getting to one, even though that wasn't a requirement in the fit. Um, so that says that the, the normalizations we did were actually uh, pretty close. So here I'll just say fit the selected groups. Now it'll fit all of these. And then over here in this page, there'll be a list for each and a, a group of, of fits for each group. Um, and we can see the fits for 241 or 242. And that also like includes like here, there's no gold medal at all. <clears throat> it was allowed to happen, but the best fit does not include gold, gold metal at all. And for this one, there's plenty of gold foil, 40%. There's chloride, there's hydroxide. In fact, there's, there's we'll see actually throughout that like the same components, but, but we, we were pretty limited what components we let it fit. So another question you, you might ask of this data set <clears throat> is how many different, how many different components are there? Well, did we, I, I just, you know, I picked these by hand, by eye, maybe by intuition, but that's not a very, that's not a very satisfying way to look at the, how many, how many different components there are in the data. So using principal component analysis, so PCA can help answer that. So if I take these unknowns and say also similar, actually, I'll, I'll make these, wait, this was 80. I thought we did the fit from 75. I think we did. Um, as long as we're consistent, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we'll say, let's say in the normalization range from 880 to 1220, fine. Um, let's take these data sets and find the principal components. So if you're not uh, familiar with this, I'm gonna say build model with selected components. So we can go over what this does. It takes, it's gonna take this data set uh, of, of these seven, um, eight, eight spectra, and it's gonna first take the average. Um, that's shown here. Um, that's the mean spectrum. And it's gonna subtract it from all of those. That takes the mean out, like there's an edge step. There's, there's gold, so there's an edge step that goes up or wiggles. That's what we know. Um, so that we'll take that out and then we'll do the average of the residual. And then that's the first component. Of course, you can do that with, in a linear algebra way uh, more effectively and like, get the most important components, the second most important. So these are then the pieces of the spectra that vary the most. Those aren't actually gold spectra. They have nothing to do with the X-ray absorption. Well, they, they don't indicate any uh, local structure about the X or chemical state of the X-ray from of the X-ray absorption properties of gold, but they are about the data set that show the biggest changes in the data set. So we can use those. And then the question is, how many of these components are above the noise level or, or are real components? And I'll, I'll get rid of these. And you can see that by the time we get to component four and five and six, we're really at the noise level. There are, there are like mathematical ways of doing that. And one of them is to look at the variance and the fits. So here's what's called a scree plot. Scree is like, when, a, when you have a slope or you, when you have a, a mountain or an edge and it starts to, to, starts to fall off, the rocks start to fall off and you get a characteristic slope function and that uh, of the like sort of exponential decay. So if we plot that in a log plot, we see like, what is the goodness of fit? What's the variance from each one of those? And that there are several statistics for telling you how many components there should be, how many are are significant. And with this approach, like it's pretty clear that there's something like three or four components of these eight data sets that are actually varying between them. So between these eight data sets, there's really probably four things changing. Maybe there's five, maybe there's three, and but there's not eight. They're not that distinct. Um, so when we're doing a linear analysis, we, we can say there are four components changing and let's find out what those are. So now that we have these components, we can go back to our standards and say, let's say there's maximum five components, and then let's fit our standards to those components. This is, this is often called the, what is, is, uh, some, a target transformation or a target test. So let's test the, this current group, gold foil, with those uh, components. If I do that, I get a good fit. So there's the, yeah, I, it moved away. Um, there's the, the fit and the first with the first five components. 
Um, so that indicates to me that gold foil is represented by those components. If I do that for gold chloride, do the same thing, test the current group. And, and in fact, here we get fit, fit statistics listed in chi-square is, goodness of it, is 0.01. That's a good fit. If I do with gold chloride, it also works. And actually, I'm pretty sure that gold aqueous chloride is going to work too. And that works pretty well. And if I do gold hydroxide, um, that works. That's much. That's how well did that work? Wait, this one. Actually, if we look at that, it doesn't look very good. It looks really noisy and it misses this point. That's and a chi square was 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 maybe, and now it's 0.6. It went up a lot. That's a much worse fit. And it kind of did some really crazy things. So it, you might conclude from this that gold hydroxide is not in that, is not in those spectra. Uh, test the current group. And also like gold cyanide is, is also not a very good fit. You might conclude that gold cyanide is not in there. Uh, gold, but gold thiocyanide has a, is much better. So this is okay. Um, that's not great, but not terrible. Like thiocyanide and sulfide and all of these like sort of match, but they, but that's a little worse. So you could see that like, especially that gold hydroxide was not very, not a very good match. So this, you might say, you might conclude from this that then we want to take the, the spectra that match, the, the standards that match our, our components and use those as the components for our linear combination fit. And we saw that like, okay, so if we go back here, we, we use gold foil, we use gold chloride, whether we use the, the solid or the aqueous phase probably doesn't matter a lot. They're a little bit different, but not a lot. But we, use, we did use hydroxide and we use cyanide. So maybe we shouldn't use those. Maybe we should use gold. Let's try. I want to keep the hydroxide in there. Maybe not the cyanide, but we'll try one of these. I'll just try maybe that. In fact, let's, let's, why not use that one too? And then go back to here and select none and select all above these and fit those selected groups. Let's go back to these fits and look at that again. Um, our linear combination fits. Now, still, if I, the best fit for this one is foil and some chloride and thiocyanide, and that looks pretty good. And for this set, um, that also looks, that also looks pretty good, but that included some gold hydroxide which give a really bad chi-square value. That's kind of confusing. Um, if we plot this one, that also gives a good fit. It also includes some gold hydroxide. Um, and that's, so that's, and plot this fit. And it also includes gold hydroxide. So it really seems to like gold hydroxide. Um, these fits aren't, these, I, I would say these fits are good, but not great. And, but many of them have, in fact, if we go back and look at this, the gold hydroxide in them is 0.14 and 0.15 and 0.13. Uh, that one's a little lower, 0.17 or 0.07 and 0.1. That one didn't, that one had a little less, 0.06. And this one has 0.14. So in fact, it, it, you might conclude actually that there is gold hydroxide in all of these, but that it's constant. And, that's, and that gets back to what PCA tells you, is that when we said PCA, we go back to these components and look at the gold hydroxide, the gold hydroxide isn't a very good fit. Actually, it can be, it can be kind of represented with the data, but the chi-square isn't very good. Um, why didn't that show up there? I wanted that to show up. No, oh, it, it, it is there. The gold hydroxide has a high chi-square and the fit looks pretty noisy. But the PCA really only tells you, only finds components that vary. So if the component is constant, it'll, be, it'll show up in the mean. And so a good part of that gold hydroxide is probably in that mean spectrum that, that is not a varying component. So just because it's, 
So if a component is not varying, it won't show up in PCA, but it might really be there in the, in the spectrum. So that's just a cautionary tale of like, so that's how you do PCA analysis, how you can combine that for linear analysis, linear combinations, and a cautionary tale in what can go wrong. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, things to look for. That's not quite wrong. It's right, but it's, um, it, it's a little, it can be a little confusing if you naively interpret that to mean that there's no gold hydroxide. Um, okay, so that's, let's, let's pause there because I think we're getting close to where we want to think about what we're doing next. Um, are there any questions about that? Um, and and what should what what's next to do? Um, I, I should say, like, I, actually, I, I will show you this. So, oh, I guess we're going to be pre-edge peak fitting. I'm going to. So here, it, it warns me about saving us saving this this session file. Um, it large automatically saves or large XAS viewer automatically saves the session files, and that. So if I go back to here, and I'll close this window, but I'll like. I'll save this session file. I'll save it to like actually there called PCA. It would normally be with with I'll just overwrite that like that's from a while ago. Um, and now if I close this or just while uh, oh, yes yeah, so overwrite that file. <coughs> um, sorry, excuse me. Clear the session. Now if I go back and re reread in that session file, um, open data and that same session file from today. Um, import everything and it will remember it will have remembered those uh, the, the linear combinations and the sets we did so uh, it was in fact if I show say show fit results it will have those linear combination fit results in them those are buried in the data sets and they'll stay in the file so you can mail that session file and it will include all of the results of the of the analysis and I'll show that for the pH peak fitting too which I'll do next if there's no questions right now um, so I'll, again, like select all and remove the selected points. And then we'll go on to um, pre-edge peak fitting. So I'll, I'll have some gold. Uh, yeah, so here's a, here's a project file for, for some gold or some iron, uh, iron oxide spectra. Get rid of these. And here the, here the whole, Question is, can we fit these pre-edge peaks? That often indicates valence. Um, in fact, if I, oh, I should check the normalization. Here, the normalization is pretty good. I'm just going to go a little bit further out in this um, and copy that to everybody. I'm going to. That probably made it worse, didn't it? Got to make it worse first um, before you make it better. Um, that's pretty good. And then if we look at, if we look in close detail at these, um, there's a wide variation in valence state, iron two plus to three plus, and, the, and these period peaks can really be uh, <clears throat> used to, to measure those two. So what people often want to measure is the centroid of those pre-edge peaks. As that moves, that's, that can be highly correlated with, with valence. So if we go over to this pre-HP tab, <clears throat> um, we can do this. We can do the fit of this uh, this one. I'll start with one that's um, start with one that's definitely has two peaks in it. I'll start with that one, <clears throat> pre-HP, and I'll just say what I'm going to do. I'm going to. This is a little confusing for people who don't do pre-HP peaks of iron or other transition high. High Z's or the high end of the transition metal range. I'm just going to hit fit baseline. And we'll, I'll come back to like what that did. The first thing you want to do is fit a line plus the Lorentzian. So it actually fit. We're going to fit the data, the spectra between two energy ranges. I'm going to just make those nice round numbers of. Uh, it, it picked values based on E zero. So I'm just going to like pick nice round numbers, and of there, and then we told it to fit a baseline, a line plus a Lorentzian, ignoring this, this range here. So that's indicated by these black dots. Once you've done that, we're set. We got, we have two components. We have two components to the, uh, to the model that we're gonna make for this uh, spectrum. We have a polynomial, a line, and we have a peak that's 
that's a Lorentzian that, that peaks up over here. The peak of the, the Lorentzian is at 718. Um, and that, that will then model the, the background. And we want the, we sort of want the area under those, those peaks. In fact, <clears throat> it already reports the centroid of the data that's left over from that. Whether that's a good measure or not, we'll come back to you. That's 711.7. But we're going to add peaks to fit that spectrum. So I'm just going to say, let's start with the Gaussian. And I go, so there's a Gaussian. It comes up and it's got an amplitude, a center, a sigma, and, and so on. And I'm going to say, pick values from plot, click here, and then click twice on the plot. And it will say, that's where you want to draw the first. That's done. We're going to use that in the fit. It's not part of the baseline. I'll get back to that in a second. And we can also do things like, say, the, we're going to force the amplitude to be positive. OK. We know there's a second peak here, so we'll just do the same thing. We'll add another Gaussian. Uh, and then Gaussian two, again, we'll say, pick from the plot, and we'll go click on the plot in two places, and then drew that. Okay, so now if I say plot the current model, uh, we get here, it's not great, but it's, it's a good start. If we do fit the current model or fit the current group, then we're gonna fit this group to that spectrum. And that looks pretty good. Um, here, that, that's a decent looking fit. It may not be perfect. Um, we're gonna make it perfect. Um, so here's the, the label and then the, all, the, all of the pieces, the, like the, Gauss, the height of the, the height, the sigma of the first, of the second Gaussian of the first Gaussian, all those parameters, all the standard errors. There's 11 variables, here's chi-square. And we can plot this fit again. Again, like it brings up a results page that has, that will have all of our data sets and all the fits we do to it. Um, and I can do plot with residual here. And you can see, once you can, you might be able to see, you can see that there's actually quite a bit of like structure in that residual. So it's not a very, it's actually not a very good fit. There's a big thing out here uh, at, at the high energy range, like we need another peak. And then, all, but also these peaks aren't fit very well. You can also say plot the baseline subtracted, which will show those peaks after subtracting what we called baseline. And baseline here was just, we just defined it as, is this part of the baseline? So we had that, that one Lorentzian and that one line as, as the baseline. And the other two were not baseline. So that's part of the peaks we're gonna find the centroid of. Whether that's interesting to you probably depends on whether you're doing iron pre-edge peaks, but this works, this pre-edge, this peak fitting works for all the other elements too, sulfur and so on. So, but let's go back because like, now I want to work on changing that. So I might want to add a third peak. I could add another peak. Um, I'm going to plot the current model. And I'm going to add another peak, um, another Gaussian. And I'm going to, but I'm going to do it further up, like maybe here. It's not too tight. I'm going to make sure that that's positive. And then I'm going to do a thing, like just, just to show you that this can be done. The first Gaussian, we had 11.6. I'm just going to say that it has a range that it can go from 7, 1, say 7, 105, and then to like 7, 1, 1, 3. Just so that it, it can't go out of those ranges. I think Gaussian 2 will say a lower limit of 7, 1, 1, 2 or so, so that we know which order they are, so that when we're doing these fits, they can't like switch which one is which, which it, it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's kind of confusing. Um, so I'll do the same thing that this peak can't go below 7.4. I can say it can't go above something, but it's probably fine. So if I plot that model, it's got like too big of a peak here, but that will get resolved in the fit. So if I do this now, fit the current group, um, it's thinking about it. And it might, this might be a not very good fit if it's thinking about it that hard. <laughs> Okay. There, now there's a second fit where we added more variables. Chi-square and reduced chi-square got a little better, but it, something looks kind of weird here with the baseline. Like it couldn't find the error bars. That, that's an indication that something hit a limit or that something went wonky. Um, and if I plot that with the residual, it's still pretty good, but the but that one peak, it sort of took over where that baseline was. So I think that's not, maybe not the full story yet. So let me go back to this um, and let me just delete these three Gaussians. 
and go back to the go back to the beginning of where this was going wrong and use a different peak shape. Um, we know that especially for BMOS at the APS, the, the energy resolution is actually pretty good. And using void functions can be a noticeable improvement in, in, um, in uh, fit quality. So I'm going to use a void function. That's a, that's a convolution of a, of a Lorentzian and a Gaussian. And I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm using, picking two of those and then plot that model and fit that group. And then let's go get our results page. And if I, like if we go back here, let me just rename this one. That was at 1101. I'm gonna call that two Gaussians. Um, update that label. And then this one was two void. Just, to, just so we have some, so we can tell what they were. And if we compare those two, the cut screws are actually not very different. Those look, both look pretty good. Um, and there's still like something not quite right. Like we should include another peak and maybe we should go further up in the energy range and, and, uh, and include, include better include that next peak up. If we, we could also like, I should say, we shall say, I could say update the model with these values so that we get those values pushed back in. And now if I say plot the current model, it looks pretty good. And like, there's that peak and we went further up. Um, so that's interesting that we can do that. Um, and clearly we don't want to fit all the way up there. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a big misfit if we try to fit that. So I would also say like this, this fit is not bad and it might be that that's a good measure of, of what we're actually trying to do. So I might say, let's take all those fits and fit all of them. So we'll hit say, fit the selected spec, the selected groups. And now that's fit all of them. And we can look at the residuals and the fits for all of those and see, you can see that some of them are actually pretty good, especially when that second peak is pretty high so that it's more oxidized. Um, and there's clearly some misfits and we can, we can do, you know, we can go on from here and improve this. But I think that gives a flavor of what, what um, you can do with pre-edge peak fitting uh, as a first start. Then also you can, like save these, uh, save you know the parameters and the statistics for all the groups into a spreadsheet, um, and you can save the model and bring that in later. So you can load this mo load this model for fitting, or or save the models um, uh, here under pre HP. You can load load a model after you've saved it, and so on. So you can reproduce this model, um, and then the the excess fitting with with FEFIT will be look pretty similar. Uh, in character to this. So maybe that's a good time to, to pause for questions on all the Zane's analysis we've done. Um, are there any questions? Are there any thoughts? Uh, let me go, maybe I can go look at the chat. Yeah, I think um, there's something from Chris. Chris, why don't you just uh, unmute yourself and ask if you, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure thing, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, perfect. So uh, kind of two questions. The first was, is there a limit to the number of fit components you can add here in large? Sure. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean maybe, that's probably a bad idea to say, sure, you go ahead and add 500 components. But no, there's not a limit. OK, now I'm just thinking about using this for potentially fitting extra emission, where you need Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, so like, OK. I'm going to, I'm going to say this more like we have 45 minutes left. So I'm going to start merge, merging into this other, like, okay. So I, the, all of this code is like done in Python and we have a, a library LM fit that does the fitting for that. Mm -hmm. And for sure, like you can, you can totally do that. In fact, these fits, like I'll, I'll just like, and so you can do this all in Python and you can build up complex components. Other people do emission, and yes, absolutely. If you're whether whether we want to include that in a GUI or in this GUI is a good question, but for sure that that can be done. And and we if 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 you're interested in that, we could talk about like how we can better manage. So this is like called pre-edge peak fitting because mm -hmm. of this thing with it does with the baseline. But if we want to like other people have asked about this too. Should we add something that's more specific to emission fitting? 
Yeah, um, and it's definitely something we can talk about offline. Yeah, yeah. But I think that this yeah. is this is a really powerful platform for doing that kind of thing. So this is exciting. Yeah. And then the second question I had is just, can user-defined functions be used as fit components or are we limited to what is native in large? In the GUI, it's limited. In LMFIT or in the code, in the like at the code level, it's not. In fact, okay. at the code level, at the code level, these are the built-in models that we distribute with the elephant library but you can like the goal is to write your own and mm -hmm. and and in fact it does it does support using a simple mathematical expression so like we could add that the user types in an expression and uses that but if without having to write python code but mm -hmm. if you write a python function that is like pretty simple like the lorentzian one is just like you know <laughs> the lorentzian function if you if if you do that, it's easy to wrap that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. <laughs> right. So if you and in fact we include not listed here, but like well maybe listed here. Like there are, yeah. So Duniac and there are other things that like you know might be what the emission people want or XPS people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Any anyone else? Anything else? So, what was what was next on our agenda? Shall we? Are we? Uh, are we doing okay on agenda this? Yeah, I think we are doing okay. Um, you want to do some the YBCO, or okay. I, I, or or should we or should we go to Kai of K? Should we go to X House or should we go to Fefe? Yeah, maybe we should go to Fefe. Um, I don't know, we could take a, a show of hands since we know how to do show of hands um, with the whole team. Um, let's right, see was, here. And I'm, the, yeah, go ahead. One person, one person asked, so, one, so there's a question also about um, somebody fitting with Artemis in, in K-Space and the error bars that they got in case space. I'm not sure I fully understood everything about the question, but like there's a question about fitting in case space versus R space and the impact on error bars for that. So maybe when we do um, about, when we talk about XS fitting in the next 45 minutes, we can uh, mention that as well. Okay, that sounds good. All right, let me- um... I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And I will attempt to model some data. Okay. Just see if I can get. Um, hey, so Emma Marie has a question. Just go ahead and speak up. Yeah. I Hi. just thought of this. Um, so I'm thinking about the pre edge fitting. Um, mm -hmm. Say iron pre edge peaks, ugh, iron pre edge peaks. Um, is there any way to include error bars on the data set itself? There, there, there are. Um, yes, uh, that's not very well exposed in the GUI at the moment, but but in the for sure in the um, like in the like Python code, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and. Uh, that, that should be added if there's an array that's called, you know, D delta mu or something that they should just use that by default. Um, okay. We do that for, we do, we do that for XAFs actually. Um, uh -huh. We don't do, but pre edge peak fitting, we should do, do a better job. So, so those error bars, right. So then there's this whole thing about how do you, how do you get error bars when you don't have good uncertainties in the data? And there's this whole trick of like increasing chi square, not by one, but by chi square reduced. Like it's a common, but if the error bars are changing, like if you like count rates are changing and so your error bars are changing with energy, it can make an impact. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good thing to add. Okay, so I think I'm sharing my screen. Does everybody see the, uh, the large GUI? Yep. Okay, great. 
All right, so in this next part, I will just pull in some of my favorite platinum data and uh, give an attempt to model it. So um, I'm gonna go up here and open a data file and it brings me to some platinum foil. I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. Uh, it's already been processed into XMU data and didn't quite uh, recognize that as XFs type. So we wanna make sure we get that part right. E at the beginning, we're not gonna divide by anything. It's XMU, it's just constant. So then we're gonna say it looks good and we will import that data set. We can plot that data set in a normalized mu of E. And where did the plot go? The plot is over on this other screen. Right here. Okay. So it looks um, pretty good, uh, normalized data. Um, I happen to know these data pretty well. And what, one of the things that I, um, that I can pick up in uh, is that this, uh, the pre-edge is a little bit uh, squashed. So you can see that it comes up above zero here and it uh, pulls down. We can plot the current group with the post edge and the pre-edge line. And you can kind of see that it doesn't follow really well. And so we can take this pre-edge line and just back it up a little bit. So it's, it's already starting to use the part that's curving up is what I'm noticing here. So if we back it up, to like minus 60 relative to E0 and then plot the group again that looks uh, much better to my eye. The post edge line looks pretty good to me. I don't think we need to uh, tweak that. So let's plot normalized again. So if I click the button, I can switch it to this other type of plot and uh, that pre edge line looks, looks a little bit better to me there. We can then um, take a look at the go right into looking at where the background function is. And that is over here, um, over in the XFs tab. We can plot the group and the background uh, right here. And that shows you what that looks like. You can zoom in on the absorption edge, take a look at how that looks. It looks pretty good to me. And um, right now we're using an RPGG value of 1.0. We can, um, and then we're using the whole data range from zero to 16 for the K range and the K weight of one in the background subtraction. We can go ahead and plot that in chi of K and it looks pretty uh, fabulous. And this is with a K weight of two. You can change the K weight of the plot here so we can plot it with K-weight three. As Matt said, that emphasizes the high K range, two and one, that emphasizes the low K range. Uh, that's just in the plot. And then we can plot the Fourier transform. So the magnitude, ah, but we see that we have a fairly strong peak here around one angstrom. And it looks like there's a question in the chat. Is there something there or am I missing? I'm not quite sure. Ah. You're okay. I'll, I'll watch the chat. I was answering. Oh, question okay. Okay. No problem. All right. So we took a Fourier transform and we see we have a pretty strong peak at one angstrom, even though this is a platinum foil. So we're pretty sure that that's part of the background. And so um, we can remove that by increasing the RPGG value. Let's go back to plotting the data with um, the background function and zoom in on that a little bit. And then if we increase RBKG, let's go up to maybe 1.2. Okay, now you can see that we've got a lot more of a wiggle in the background function shown there. And we can plot that in, um, and actually, what's what's really good to do always uh, a really good practice is to always make a second copy of the data set, and then you can use um, an RBKG value of one and two, and then compare them. So I'm going to go ahead and do that up here in 
uh, where is it? Uh, here, copy group. So right click on the data on the file name. You can make a copy. And then um, we can set RBKG value for this one to be 1.0 and the other one can be 1.2. And then you can plot that one, the mu of E, that's the 1.2. This one's 1.0. And then we can plot them both in chi of k. And you can see the difference that the different RBKG values make. And it looks to me like the red one has the lower RBKG value, which it does. The other one is 1.2, yes. So we can plot them both. And then you can plot the Fourier transform of both of them. And it didn't remove it. Maybe 1.2 is not quite enough. We can try 1.4 or 5. Plot those two. Starting to get uh, removed. That's interesting that it's pushing it up, looks like, to my eye. 1.5 is the maximum of that guy. And then you could go all the way up to maybe 1.7. That's interesting. Now it's starting to uh, remove it completely. And then you could look at the chi of k data from the two data sets, it looks something like this. So it looks like we made a pretty big difference here at rather, rather low k. Oh, and we're Fourier transforming all the way from 2 to 15.5. Uh, to and so that also is part of the reason why the RBKG value is affecting this data so much, because we are using that low k range. If we go up a little bit higher, like 3, and plot both of them again, let's see what difference that makes. So I want to copy that to both data sets. And then I'm going to check that that's actually the case, which it is. Plot them, the magnitude of R. Now they look much more similar uh, in this range. But uh, in the first one, we have a strong peak at really low um, K, R. All right. So let's go ahead and use this one with a RBKG value of 1.7 and um, a k-min value of 3. And let's try to fit that data. So let's plot that chi of k data one more time. All right, so we're just going to use this one. OK. So we're going to uh, move over to the FEF fitting. The first thing we need to do is to get um, a FEF calculation. You can do that by going up into the menu at the top. Click um, on the uh, browse the SIF files. Brings up another window, I hope. Where did it go? Is it behind? It's here somewhere. Huh. Can't seem to find that window. That's really odd. Um, Let me just close it and try to. Is it, it is, is it on a different screen? It might be, but I can't find it on the other screen either. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, uh, I just closed it. Let me see if I do it this time, if it will open it up and bring it up here. No, it doesn't want to bring it up here. That is really weird. Uh, so. Oh, hold on. Let me try this. Um, oh, here it is. 
All right, I found it. Aha. Okay, trouble with Windows. That's not large. <laughs> okay, so um, here's the um, the the file menu for um, exploring the database. So we can say things like uh, a mineral name. You can put in platinum. Uh, you can include elements. So let's say PT, and uh, you can say we want to include only the elements listed. So uh, only platinum and then you can search the SIF files and it brings up a big list. Um, in general, I like the ones from the from the 20s and 30s. Uh, sometimes the ones that are newer are like high pressure phases and so you have to be a little bit more careful with them. Um, but it's a good it's not a bad idea to um, click on a couple of them and then scroll down and see what the unit cell parameters are in the space group. That's pretty helpful. And um, you can also, uh, as I mentioned before, very simply check out the uh, XRD pattern. And then uh, the FEF input file is shown here as well. And I often like to take a look at quickly at the first shell of atoms and make sure that they're at reasonable distances. So 2.7 angstroms is, is reasonable for platinum. And um, so it's a good idea to take a look at that before you hit the uh, run FEF button, which is shown here. So that's what we'll do next. Um, another couple of parameters, the absorbing atom in this case is platinum. It's very simple. And the cluster size is seven angstroms. And then this is the version of uh, FEF. And then the edge is gonna be the L3 edge. So you can choose uh, the K edge or the L edge. It makes a guess. Um, and it's that's correct for this one. It's L3 edge. You hit run FEF. And it'll uh, show you the um, the paths and the geometry that uh, I mentioned before. And then we're going to go ahead and just completely close this window and go back up into FEF and browse the FEF calculations. And that will show you the um, all of the uh, calculations that are in your folder. And you can go into that folder and add calculations if you want to as well. This is the one that we just made. And so I can import. Oh, that's weird. This is this is sulfur. Huh, that's not what I want. Uh, OK, platinum. Hmm. I don't know if I if I chose a sulfur path or not. But in any case, let's take this one. That's uh, We definitely don't want sulfur path. So we're going to take uh, platinum at 2.74. And then we're going to import that path. And then it shows up here at the bottom of the page with the um, platinum foil. And uh, it automatically gives you some ideas on how to include the parameterization. So the amplitude is 12 times S0 squared. We have an E0, a delta R, and a sigma squared. And you can see that those have been automatically populated into the parameters page. And you can plot the, uh, the current model with the chi of k uh, data. And you can see what it looks like. And so that's the current model. Uh, shown in, in red and the data is in blue. You can also do that with the real part of the Fourier transform, which is my favorite. Um, and it can sh it'll show you how well the data and the theory are matching each other before you do any, um, any fitting. Um, if your model is really far away from your data, then uh, trying to do a fit will probably lead to a local minimum that isn't good anyway. So this is always a good uh, first step. We'll just take a look here uh, quickly at the, uh, the data range. So in case space, um, that's interesting. That didn't actually plot. Um, oh, plot current. Let's plot chi of k. OK, oh, that's the fitting space. OK, that's R. OK, so we can do that later. Uh, but let's right now, we'll do the fitting space in R. Uh, we're going to plot the current model and the data in um, 
chi of k. So right now we're going to use a k minimum of three and a k max of about 15. 0.7, which is actually very close to the very end of the data set. So we might want to bring that in just a little bit. Let's say 15.0. It's got a Kaiser-Bessel window of, of, with a function of four. Uh, that, that will work. But we can leave it there and see what happens. And our minimum has been chosen from um, 1.7. And we're only going to go out to about 3.3 .3 for our max. So 3.3, .3, 1.7. All right, and S0 squared is one, E0, delta R are almost zero, and then the sigma squared is 0 0.008. And let's try to give that a whirl and see what happens. So fit the data to the model. And uh, it does a pretty fabulous job. Here's the... Um, Best fit parameter, sigma squared is 0 0.005. Uh, sigma squared is 0 0.96. E0 is about 10 EV. So that's actually quite uh, a big value for E0. Delta R is 0 0.02 angstroms, which is pretty small. So let's say that we decided that we wanted to um, make E0 a little bit smaller than uh, 10 angstroms you could go back and vary that in the XFS page. So maybe what we could do is take the second example and set it this to be the same. So now I want to copy that over. No, it doesn't want to copy 1.7. We're going to put both of these now to make sure that they look about the same. 3 to 15. All right, and plot both selected groups in chi of k. OK, they look exactly the same right now. And then we can also plot them, each one in mu of e. So e0 right now is at, uh, so to see this point, I think I have to go all the way back to the normalization page and show it as uh, normalized mu of e. For some reason, it doesn't see. Oh, there it is. So now you can see where the e0 is at on the absorption edge there. And so if we want to pull this other one up by like 5 eV, let's say, we can move it up to the top or more close to the top of the line, plot the current group. Um, there we go. Now it's more at the top. And actually, maybe it's all the way over the top, which I think I don't want. So let's go back a few. OK, now it's at the top of the line. OK, and then if we plot chi of k for both of these, uh, we need to go back to the excess page. Plot them both in chi of k. You can see that they've uh, the uh, second one has been shifted relative to the first. And energy. And then if you go back to the XF's fitting, and we uh, have the second one um, highlighted, and we fit the data to the model, our E0 has dropped to about 6, um, from 9 to about 6 EV. So it's a little bit uh, smaller in this case. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty good fit. So um, yeah, uh, you can go up here to show all the path parameters, which is also another really good thing to look at. And it uh, gives you the, um, the details of how all of those uh, parameters for this path have been set as well. OK. Um, so I think we had a question about fitting in uh, chi of, or fitting in R space versus K space. So I'll go ahead and give that a try. Let's see here. So I'm going to close this window. And now instead of fitting in R space, oh, one to six. 
Yeah. So, uh, so when you're when you want to carefully compare the um, the XF's uh, parameters, it's important to use the fitting range that's actually included in the data. So, by by using a fitting range that goes all the way out to six, I've included this all of this misfit in those parameters. And so um, you want to have it match pretty well. So like 3.2. So let's just do this one more time and see if we can demonstrate what that does to the fitting parameters. You do 3.2 instead of 6. And you fit, uh, you run the fit parameters. Um, so now this is the second bit. Let me show all show the path parameters. This one has an R range from 1.7 to 6. And this first one here, which was done two minutes later, show with the path parameters goes from 1.7 to 3.2. And the the uncertainty here um, in, for example, sigma squared is uh, 1.6 times um, 10 to the minus 4. And in the other one, it's 8.7 times 10 to the minus 4. So we, we reduced the, uh, the uncertainties by like a, a, about a factor of 4 just by shortening the data range to uh, match the actual model. So we've 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 taken out a whole bunch of misfit um, from the from the data, and that has reduced the uncertainties in those parameters. So it's important to have the data range uh, match the model. All right. So then let's go back to the fit and do one with K space instead of um, R space. So um, what happened to my window? All right, so instead of k-space, we're going to, oh, that's another thing that I could demonstrate as well. So you have the option for using a k-weight of 2, 1, 2, or 1, 2, and 3 in the optimization. Generally speaking, if you use the k-weights of 1, 2, and 3, you'll reduce your uncertainties as well, because then you're optimizing the low and the high and the middle part of the spectrum. Um, but uh, let's just leave that as two right now. And then let's go to uh, k-space. So if we're going to fit the data in k-space, we should probably look at the current model in k. Um, it looks like that. And it looks pretty reasonable. And then the k range, of course, is going to be 3 to uh, uh, three is about here, three to about 15, which is really close to the end. And then we're going to go ahead and hit fit the data to the model. Um, looks pretty darn fabulous as well. And then we can compare those parameters and the, um, and the fits. And um, Let's see here, if I click on this last one, so sigma squared, for example, is 5 times 10 to the minus 3 with an uncertainty of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. I would say that's pretty similar, um, not, not exactly similar. We have a, a smaller error in, um, in uh, our second model, right, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 compared to this is one point. Uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 3. So the uncertainty is quite a bit larger when you fit the data in k-space. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's because in k-space we're including all of these higher frequency signals that haven't been um, that haven't been modeled just like when we had the data range was all the way from 1 to 6. Um, instead of just over the part of the spectrum that we're actually modeling. So we've included higher frequency signals here that we aren't modeling, which will increase the uncertainties. So um, let's see. Yeah, yeah Shelly, Shelly, I would say that that's exactly right. And it, also, yeah. if, you, if you sort of expand that, plot, that table, you could show 
the value of chi-square or reduced chi-square for each of those fits where you did those? Because I think they that'll vary a lot too. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The, the chi-squared and the reduced chi-squared is much, much bigger um, in k-space than it is in the, uh, in the, uh, um, it, than it is uh, when you do it in R. Right, and also reducing the, the R range to the right one also yeah. got, reduced chi-squared very close to one or pretty close to one. That's actually true. That's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, any other questions there? Any other variations you want to try on this fit and see what differences it makes? Or we're actually pretty cl close to 1140. We're supposed to click. Oh, could we do a, a fitting in the wavelet space? So of course you can. Um, we could do that. Uh, change the button to wavelet. Uh, Matt, is there anything else I should check on here when I do that? Give it, give it a try. Give it a try and see what happens. Um, let's see, is there a way to show the wavelet? Do I need to go back to XFs to actually show the wavelet? I think maybe I do. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, so if I go back to XFs, always like, and then you can show the wavelet here. And it gives you a grayscale map. So this is chi of, chi of K and this is R. And that's the wavelet. This looks like our first shell strong peak. Um, all right, so let's try to do a fit with that wavelet. I don't know, is there anything in here I should change? I think it's okay. Yeah, let's just yeah. give it a try. Yeah, because it'll use the same R and K range, basically. OK. And then we're going to do a fit to the data. And that's and can what, you, what we have. It did it, but can you plot it <laughs> in wavelength? That's the, I think that's the. Plot the current okay. model. Looks like I can plot filtered, but I don't know that I can plot it. I think maybe not. Yeah, I think I think it's just that like, well, maybe maybe someone could suggest how, how to show two images and show a fit of two images. <laughs> it's just you know. Yeah, it's, it's a little fun. tricky. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so so wait, there's also can can you set parameters and choose which to fit is a question and. Yes, you can do that. Yeah, so I can show that one. So let's go back to our space, which is my favorite. And then um, here's the parameter list right here for these uh, for these data. So let's just say that I wanted to, to change one for, for example, um, let's say I, I knew, for example, that it, this is going to be sigma squared times 1.05, just to put a just to put a, an expression in there instead. So then you can go to the parameters page and it's pretty smart. It put the sigma squared value in here for me automatically. But it, and, and then it skips this other one that, uh, that we've removed. And then you can say that, um, let's say that we wanted to, um, to, to vary this, you know, between zero and one is still a good idea, but let's say maybe, Maybe we know what uh, S0 squared is now um, because that's what you would do later. And let's just fix it and say it needs to be 0 0.96 instead. Then, um, so this is a, just a slightly different, different model and we can um, plot, plot it with uh, uh, the current model again, it's shown here. And then you can um, fit it and the plot also again looks really good, but now we have this value for sigma, which is five percent smaller than what it was previously, because of the uh, the equation that we put in there. And then sigma squared. Oh, I thought I said it. 
why is it still showing up as as a variable? That's interesting. Let me go back and check on that again. Parameters. Oh, I did have it as very. Huh. Thought I said it. Okay, we're gonna fix it to 0 0.96. Now it's fixed. If I go back and forth, oh, it. it I think I Ooh. can't go back and forth. That's really weird. Yeah. That's a problem. That's a problem. Okay, we're gonna leave it fixed, and then I'm gonna fit the data to the model and see if it stays. And it did. It went out yeah, of the variable. Was... Now it's out of the variable list, and it's down here in uh, the core. Oh, the correlations also is shown from uh, so both s zero squared and sigma squared affect the amplitude, which uh, uh, they're highly pretty highly correlated. But then if you go into the show parameters path. Um, <laughs> where did that go? It's, it's somewhere. It, it's it's hidden somewhere. Fetch results. No. The report. There we go. Okay. And you can see the uh I was gonna show you where it showed you the parameterization for the sigma squared, but that's actually not shown here. Just the final result is here. Oh, no, it's here, down yeah. here at the bottom. So it's sigma squared times 1.05, and there's the actual uh, 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 value that sigma squared was set to there. OK. So there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, yeah. See, there was, yeah, you can sum up. OK, so then Mark Schlossman asks, what, do these huge chi-square values mean for fitting in k-space? The fits are not terrible, are they? And I think that, so the, the issue is that when you fit in k-space, you haven't filtered out. So there's those high frequency components that are in the data that aren't in the model. So there's a big misfit. Yep. We understand what that misfit's from. We're not really trying to, so there is a big misfit. The fit is kind of terrible, but over the frequency range of the first shell, it's actually as good as it's gonna be, even if you, right. uh, once you pick the right range. Yeah. Okay. And maybe that's also answers Vikash's uh, question of, can you tell a little bit more about goodness of fit with the reference to chi-square and reduced chi-square? So the, all of this, all of the statistics there, there's chi-square, reduced chi-square, R factor, and there's this IKK information criteria. Those are all meant to be measures of goodness of fit. They're all slightly different. It, the documentation has a little bit on this. Um, basically cha change how you like you know what you call they're, they're mostly the sum of squares of the residual and then there's some variations on that um yep okay right and right my, my yeah so we need to be able to find a better way to visualize the plots in wavelet space that's that's right that's true <laughs> on the list and this thing about the setting of the then also i'll look into that and then Eric Binter asks, I think you mentioned how the uncertainties in the raw data are now being included. Is that correct? It, uh, yeah, so, okay. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me read the question because this is being recorded. So, okay, so Eric Binter asks, I think you mentioned that the uncertainties in the raw data are now being included in the XS analysis. Is that correct? Can you elaborate on that? Does this mean that two identical data sets would differ only in their uncertainties will give different uncertainties in the FIT parameters? Okay, a couple of things to unpack there. Yeah, so in fact, the, the uncertainty, if you have uncertainties in your data, and that could be for merging data, there'll, there'll be a, a a standard error in that. And then also when we do the background subtraction, we actually include in that, we derive from that, like that's also a fit. Those parameters imply a, a uncertainty in the background function so that we get an uncertainty in chi of k. In fact, not sort of separate here, but that uncertainty in chi of k from the background subtraction is not uniform in k space. This, is, this has been like sort of like talked about for a long time. We finally now do that and we include that uncertainty when we're fitting in our when we're fitting the data. And that's that's one of the reasons why reduced chi square is now closer to one when we fit that, which is like in stats 101 or maybe 201 or something, reduced chi square of one is typically a measure of a 
the, that the fit is good or that the uncertainties that you included in the data sets are right. Like, are the, or the, the data matches, the fit matches the data to the level of the uncertainties in the data. Um, there's a lot, there's sort of a lot to unpack in there. There's a lot of, of uh, um, yeah. And counting statistics by themselves are usually not included in, like it, it's conceivable that you could include one, when you're reading the data, some measure of the uncertainty. And like, maybe that's something that we should do a, what, like a, a better job of exposing in the GUI that, or in the, in these processing steps that, especially if you're doing like say Herfty data or Rick's data or stuff there, where the count rate is pretty low, but you still want to include all the uncertainties that we include that well. Um, typically for XF's data, we've just said that the processing uncertainties dominate and that um, so we and that we can include them. I'll also say that in all of the in the statistics for the or the uncertainties for the fitted parameters, those all increase chi-square by reduced chi-square, not by one. That's so that if we if you make a a constant error in the uncertainty in the data, it doesn't have a huge effect on the, on the parameters uncertainty. That mostly scales out, but not completely. And if you do something like fitting K space instead of R space, then where that, un, where that misfit is, is different too. And it's, and it's huge, so that will have an impact on the actual uncertainties in the parameters. Whew. There's a lot to, <laughs> We could probably go on for hours in just in just like that, like and and I think that, that these are all great questions because that's important to like when you're really getting and reporting the numbers, you want to report the the, the best of values and the uncertainties, and you want to like have these things like sort of worked out well. Um, yeah, and it's still sort of a topic of like work. So, right, we're happy to go talk about that more. Um, well, I think we're about out of time, Matt. And, and you, yeah. prom you promised that you would show a little oh. bit about scripting. Yeah, let me, okay, so let me, let me share my screen and just, I'm just gonna go uh, this, yes. Okay, this, I'll be fast. Um, screen one, let me go back to, okay, so I still have up the, the sets I was doing. And I'm just gonna go, oh, look, I'll just show you this. So all of the work that we did in the GUI uh, I can say show large buffer. This is a little weird, and it's probably going to change over the next year because I have copious free time with no users. Um, all of the steps that we did uh, for all of everything I did, I was either like reading in the other data sets and reading in the gold data, the pre-edge peaks, so the linear combination fits. That's all like actually what the GUI does is emit Python code that it then runs. And you can like save all of this. So all of the things we did are actually available to do in Python. It's a little verbose because like it's a it's a GUI, so it'll do things multiple times and it'll do them without like trying to do them cleverly or in for loops. But you can take all of these and convert it into Python code. And in fact, like these are the, most of the stuff that I've we've been able to make be separate libraries are separate libraries. So you can go and install those and you can fit peaks with Voigt models and Lorentzian models to other data sets. It doesn't have to be XFs. It could be, you know, emission, X-ray emission or XPS or, you know, data or diffraction data. Um, so all of these, all of these commands are like really just Python functions that work on groups of data sets. Uh, it's pretty easy to do a simple script. So that means that it's, it would be easy to take like say at your beam line, run, the background subtraction, auto back and a Fourier transform. And as the data comes in, show the Fourier transform. Like you'd have to like, you know, set it up so that like the parameters were right, you did the pre-edge subtraction, but you could do that and have like that as part of a quality check of the data. Or you could also like then automate these, a lot of these processing, you know, when you take the data, I know the model to use for the pre-edge peaks, just fit it and report the centroid as the data is coming in. Those are all doable and, you know, definitely applying these to doing, to use the GUI for doing, you know, an, analyzing the first 10 spectra and then ship that off to do the next thousand. Um, so all of that is available. Um, and if you have questions about like how to do that in practice, like let me know. There, there's also like, we're, we're working toward 
even making this better like so that this so that this interface here that shows a like some a command line that you can type at can be um, turned into a Jupyter uh, interface to this or or IPython interface. To that. So if you have any questions about that or anything else in this, you know, let us know. Or like there's a mailing list. The IFF mailing list is valid for this. All of this code and development is on GitHub. There are GitHub discussions or issues if you want to raise them. We're doing that all the time. Um, and everything again, everything that happened we did today is actually in encoded in this and you can save it um, and pass it on to someone else. Um, so you could if you want to turn your your students or your or yourself on to that um, to make better or other analyses, that's completely possible. Okay. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I think we're like really close to time on that. Um, so uh, one last question. Matt, before we we're going to let you go. So Yang Choi, do you want to yeah. um, uh, hey. do you want to unmute yourself and just ask? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a problem we often encounter measuring like thin films at grazing incident angle or you know measuring thick film in fluorescence mode. So at, earlier you mentioned something about over uh, over absorption. Yeah. So, elaborate what you mean and you know does large have an option correction option yeah yeah there's there is a correction under the data there's a over absorption so this is often it used to be called self-absorption it's typically but over absorption is kind of better yeah and you can you give a uh a, a formula uh for the spectra and then an incident ang angle and exit angle and it will do the because it, it knows the attenuation coefficients and it can do the adjustment or overabsorption. Um, you, you like that's that only shows up in fluorescence data. It has a similar effect of squashing the intensities as a dead time correction, like just like all of that. Like you do dead time correction, but then there is also this ability to do the overabsorption. It's it's a, it's the same algorithm as as the flow from our friend Daniel um, Haskell. Uh, so do you have it in in um in the GUI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the GUI. Yeah, here. Like, hold on. I'll uh, share okay, screen. I'll to, I mean, I can be exploring myself, but if you just show me where it is, yeah. Yeah. So for this data set here, we, we have we have two minutes, so I can do this. Uh, for this data set, data uh, correct over absorption, and if so, for here, I'll say, uh, I'll, if I say that this is iron FeSiO two. Let's see if this works. Like something else didn't work. To so do the correction for that, uh, and then there, I'll hide that. Then Pretty this good. is the that's the original and the over and the corrected. Oh, and that's the right. Then that's sort of the right effect, right? Like you could say iron point oh three, and then we do the correction. It'll be tiny, but so it you can scale the stoichiometry, and there's incident exit angle. Whether it, whether it works right for you know, let me know if it's wrong <laughs> for <laughs> for grazing incidents or grazing egg. Oh, yeah, thanks. yeah, and then, yeah, and then you save that as a new group, and then you have that data set to work with. Yep. Okay. So I'll, I guess I'll also say, like, as we're wrapping up, like, so for all of that, like, like. If you have questions about, like, especially for the people at or users, like, okay, the APS user meeting, right? Users or people and scientists at the APS, like, we, like, this is the goal here is really just like to make this do what you need it to do for your X ray absorption plus plus spectroscopy. So if there's anything that you want to see or want to talk about, like, just let us know. We're happy to, to make these like available for that. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you for all, you know your really great questions and um, for helping us uh, share with you uh, large. And I hope that uh, we all start using it all the time. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, great. No, thanks. Yeah, this was really great. Lots of lots of good questions. Okay. Okay, are we? I'm going to stop the recording.